The next three hours is your chance to participate in a discussion with one of today's leading political and social commentators. Join us as In-Depth welcomes Christopher Hitchens, contributing editor to Vanity Fair magazine and author of several books, including The Missionary Position, Mother Teresa in Theory and Practice, No One Left to Lie to, The Triangulations of William Jefferson Clinton, and The Trial of Henry Kissinger. His latest book is God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Christopher Hitchens, when people meet you for the first time, what's the first topic they want to talk to you about? Well, I think it's, well, at the moment it's certainly um, religion in one form or another. Theocracy, theology, theodicy, as some people like to call it. Um, and that's been true for a while. Uh, that would be a high chance that we would be on, be too grand to say spiritual subjects, but on, on the matter of um, whether or not we're here because of a divine plan or because we are uh, evolved creatures. And I think you can tell a lot about somebody once you uh, hear them say that they think they're not here because of biology, they're here because God wants it. Well, this is one of your more recent books, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. But when you look through your body of work, the 18 books that you've written, religion or atheism uh, kind of permeates. Yes. I mean, there was the my attack on Mother Teresa, my review of her um, misspent life. Um, in a way, my little biography of Thomas Jefferson is, is a lot to do with the origins of our First Amendment and the Virginia Statute of, on, on Religious Freedom. And another recent little book of mine about Thomas Paine and his um, Rights of Man has to discourse a bit on um, his other great work, The Age of Reason, because I think that he, for him it was most, most important of all for people to be free, that they be free of superstition first, that they, they liberate their minds from the, what William Blake called the mind-forged manacles, the, the, the things we rivet on ourselves, particularly um, serve our belief in the supernatural. Was Thomas Paine an atheist? Then? No. He wasn't, neither was Mr. Jefferson. I think actually Mr. Jefferson may privately have been an atheist, but they, um, they professed both a deism, which is the view that there may have been a first cause creator. Um, the, the universe seems to testify to some kind of order, rhythm, routine. This is before Einstein and before Darwin, of course. It was as far as you could probably look in, in the 18th century. But that this God took no interest in human affairs, didn't answer prayers, didn't intervene in politics or war or anything of that kind. Quite different from being a theist, which advances the view that God has a plan for you and that he has rules that you must obey. In other words, you must claim to know his mind. A nonsensical position. Who is Mrs. Watts, Jean Watts? Mrs. Jean Watts was uh, my, my nature and scripture teacher when I was eight, until I was about 12, um, at a little boys' boarding school in Devonshire. I'm one of those lucky ones who was sent off to boarding school at the age of eight. <laughs> Made a man of me. And um, she was a fine old lady, a widow, with um, very little culture or education, but she could take us on nature walks, show us the beauty of nature. I used to be able to tell all kinds of tree, shrub, flower, plant. And then um, she would teach us scripture, as literal truth, more or less. We'd have to go through the Bible. It's compulsory still in England to, to have religious education instruction. And um, one day she overstepped her mark, vaulting ambition of Mrs. Watts, tried to fuse her two roles and discussing vegetation. She pointed out that it was largely green, which you'll have noticed too, and we have noticed. And she said this is an excellent thing and proof of the, of the glory of God because he could have made the vegetation orange. Or, or red, or something that would really clash with our eyes, whereas green is the most restful color for our eyes, and how, how, on the whole, very decent of God it was to make the trees and the flowers and the grass, not the flowers, but the trees and the grass that way. And I sat there in my little corduroy shorts, and I thought, that's absolute nonsense. I don't know anything at this point. I don't know about chlorophyll. I don't know about photosynthesis. I don't know anything about evolution, of course, or DNA. Nobody knew about the double helix then. But I know in my, in my, in my water, as it were, I know that that's not true. It's the other, if anything, it's the other way around. The eyes have adapted to the, to the um, vegetation. 
So that was my first moment of, of thinking, I'm not sure I trust what the authorities are telling me about religion. And of course I thought I was the only one, as all of us do. But you find as you get older that many, many, many people have had the same experience. Were this is the perfect Sunday morning conversation, isn't it? Were you raised in the church? Not r very rigorously. I mean, English education requires that you go to divine service. But at what least about once your parents? Year. No. My father was a refugee somewhat from a very, very, very strict Baptist um, family with a very tyrannical, patriarchal father of his own, who I, I remember quite well. My paternal grandfather, a, a real brutal Calvinist. And my mother was from a Jewish family, um, originally from um, what is now Poland, but when they left it would have been Germany. And for various reasons, didn't want to be affirmatively Jewish. I mean, wanted to pass as, as English. And, and in fact, had succeeded in doing so. So nothing was inflicted on me at home, no. What did your father do? He was a career officer in the Royal Navy. He was a lifer. I think he's, he joined he joined a time of great poverty in his town of Portsmouth. I think he might have wanted to do it anyway. But anyway, he, he, he left school and joined the Navy. And went around the world with it and had a very tough time in the Second World War. And um, um, I remember him once telling me that war was the only time he'd ever felt terrible that it had been for him. Um, he never thought he knew what he was doing. I that's the thing of his saying of his that I remember the best. Where did your parents meet? In the war in the Navy. My mother was in the Navy too. She was, she was what we call a REN, Women's Royal Naval Service. And they met, I think, in fact, I'm sure, in Scarpa Flow, which is in the Orkney Islands. It's a very, it's a wonderful, wild, natural harbour. In the Orkney Islands, off the north coast of Scotland, which is, commands the, the North Sea, the approaches to Iceland, and, the, and um, was a place where uh, the Royal Navy used to organise convoys to go to the um, Russian front. Very, very hazardous business of escorting cargo ships over the hump of Scandinavia to Murmansk and Archangel, where the Nazis controlled the entire coastline and the air. Very grim job. Anyway, that's where they met. And you have one brother? I have one brother. And where is he? He still lives in Oxford, which is, was for a long time our family home, and was where I went to university. And he's a sort of, well, how should I describe it? He's a kind of Rush Limbaugh, no, that wouldn't quite do it. He's better than that, actually. Of England, I, I, he's actually a better writer than he is a broadcaster. He, he's a lot on the air, um, radio and television, as an extreme Christian and an extreme conservative. So I guess there has to be one in every family. Are you close? No. We never were, actually. I mean, we. I think well, for one reason we're not close is we're too close. In other words, we're too close in age. He must be about a year and a half younger than me, not much more. Which is, which is, uh, I've read a lot about this. It is too close. It's not small enough to be a baby brother, and it's too near to be a rival. Yeah. Too close for comfort. And we're also not like each other as personalities. He takes very much after my father and me. I, I would say more after my mother. We haven't lived in the same town for a very long time anyway, and our differences are not narrow ones. But that's not really the problem, I don't think. It's not that we have different opinions. I have lots of friends who are religious and conservative. Um, it's, um, it's just a, a sibling difference. Good afternoon and welcome to Book TV's In Depth. Our guest this month is Christopher Hitchens, the author of about 18 books, co-author or editor of several more. We're going to put the phone numbers up on the screen if you'd like to participate in our conversation. We're going to be here for the next three hours, noon to three Eastern time. You can also send emails or dial in on one of the numbers divided by uh, regional uh, uh, divided by regional uh, areas today. 202-737-0001. If you live in the east or central time zones, 202-737-0001. 0002 if you live in the Mountain or Pacific time zones, book TV at cspan.org in case you'd like to send an email to Christopher Hitchens. Every month, uh, the first Sunday of every month is when we do in depth. Christopher Hitchens, uh, of all your books, what's your favorite? I think the, the most recent one. And that may sound hucksterish, though, I've realized, because it's the one. The Thomas Paine or the God is on, Not Great? On the uh, sale. Um, the God is Not Great. I hope that doesn't sound to catch penny of me. Um, it is my favorite because it's the, it, 
it's the one that underlies all the other efforts I've made, really. I mean, and it's the one I've taken longest to write. It didn't actually take me long to write it as, as it now is, but I didn't start and get ready to start until I've been thinking about it for many years. The New Testament Exceeds the Evil of the Old One is yes. the title of one of your chapters. Yes. Um, that's actually a very easy proposition to prove, I think. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of horror, as everybody knows. Enough horror, actually, that some early Christians thought of founding their religion without the Old Testament. Why don't we just start a new one and leave these terrible old books behind? Marcion, among the early Christian theologians, took that view. They're stuck with it because they have to say that Jesus fulfilled prophecies from the Old Testament. So they, they have to wrap it around their neck. And as you know, it's full of murder, slaughter, torture, genocide, um, gentle mutilation, uh, massacre, and cruelty, and so forth. But there's no hell in the Old Testament. There's no talk about punishing the dead. Not in any canonical accepted New Test Old Testament book there isn't. When, when you've been killed and all your people killed with you and your wives and children sold into slavery and uh, your land taken and all of this, um, the jealous God is done with you. you you're not going to suffer anymore. It's not until Jesus says, depart from me into eternal fire. The, the hideous, really obscene idea that is also uh, adopted very strongly by Islam of torturing the dead forever um, is introduced. So, so the New Testament is commonly thought of as meeker and milder than the old, but it's not. It's much nastier. I want to show some of the other books that Christopher Hitchens has written over the years. This is A Long Short War, The Postponed Liberation of Iraq, uh, a rather short book about Iraq. A pamphlet, really. I pamphlet. Think, Jimmy, called. The Trial of Henry Kissinger. Do people still want to talk about Henry Kissinger? You seem Oh, to. yes, absolutely they do, Yeah, and, and they should, because he's still around. I mean, he's still, his advice is sometimes sought, we're given to understand by the administration, which, if it's true, in the case of Iraq, might explain something of how badly things were going. And remember, Paul Bremer, the good, catastrophic first uh, proconsul of, of uh, post-liberation Iran, was a member of Kissinger Associates. And Kissinger himself wrote in the Washington Post an op-ed piece saying, you have to be very careful with Iraq because it's a Sunni majority country. And that's as much as our great scholarly Secretary of State knew about this rather important uh, state. Well, speaking of... No, it goes on. The, 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 the the malign influence of Henry Kissinger can still be felt all over the place. Speaking of Iraq, um, the C-SPAN book TV bus travels the country, and it goes to book fairs and bookstores, and oftentimes we ask people if they have a question for our guest. One gentleman that we spoke to had a question for you about Iraq. This is from Garden City, Idaho, right outside of Boise. And my question for Mr. Hitchens is, you were a uh, strong supporter of the Iraq War when uh, uh, when it began, and, and, and actually beforehand. Uh, uh, could you maybe tell me how you feel and if you regret at all uh, the role you played in, uh, in getting the uh, support for both uh, President Bush and uh, Tony Blair to, uh, to do this war? I regret more. Um, not having argued earlier and more forcefully, in particular in 1991, when my view of it was rather different anyway, that Saddam Hussein should have been removed earlier than he was. I mean, that's, if we're to have an inquest on the war, which I think we should, I agree with the gentleman about that, and a, a full accounting of what went wrong and how our statecraft failed us, then the inquest cannot begin with George Bush's intervention in 2003. At, at the minimum, it must begin with the decision to leave Saddam Hussein in power in 1991. The so-called realist uh, decision, kissing his friends, of, uh, General Scowcroft, um, Lawrence Siegelberger, um, another faction um, around the president himself, um, George Bush Sr. and others. I, I think that was where things went critically wrong. We could have spared the Iraqi people 12 years of sanctions and, and fascism and the degeneration of their society, the consequences of which we now see. Another topic that you have covered in, in your books are the Clintons. Mm. And this is the same book, it, it, but it came out with two titles, No One Left to Lie to, The Values of the Worst Family, in paperback, and in hardback, No One Left to Lie to, The Triangulations of William Jefferson Clinton. Yeah, the, the pink one 
is actually a later and expanded edition, as well as a paperback version. There's an extra chapter in there, one on the, uh, the politics of the First Lady, which is why she's back on the cover. And one which I hadn't been able to finish in time for the first one, wasn't sure I could ever finish, about the very important and never asked and never discussed question of whether or not the women who reported being raped by Mr. Clinton were telling the truth. Well, I, the, the only book you can read that discusses this question even is by me, and I've interviewed, to, talked to three, so three women who don't know each other's existence. And I would say that I was as sure as can be that they're telling the truth. So that's the difference. That's why you should get the pink one if you're uh, strolling past a bookstore. Our guest is Christopher. More action-packed. Our guest is Christopher Hitchens, and our first call for him comes from Chicago. Yes, please, thank you. Orwell wrote of thought crimes in 1984, the final movie made by Richard Burton, just as Reagan Bushman rolled out the urine test of the trickle-down economy, grow your own medical marijuana would bring down pharma prices, just like hemp oil would bring down petrol prices, similarly for alcohol. Is that why hemp, marijuana, and alcohol users have been persecuted throughout the 20th century? Too much of anything is bad. Small doses of narcotics have been used throughout history of medicine. Less profitable therapies have been persecuted. All right, caller, what's, what, what's your point? Well, well I, think he's, I think he's made it, actually. Okay, all right. Though in a rather verbose way, well, I mean, if he's asking me, do I favor the decriminalization of marijuana, the answer is obviously yes, and not just for medical reasons. Though the most striking thing about mar marijuana is its medical pr properties. It's well known to help people deal with the hor horrible results of chemotherapy, namely intense nausea, which prevents people from recovering by making them unable to digest or keep down food. And it's also, bizarrely, uh, I don't know why this is, I'm not, I'm not a physician, but it's a, it's a very useful treatment for glaucoma, which is a very damaging condition for the eyes. But I, I just think it's beyond the competence of the state to decide a question like this. That you can't hope for the government to be able to control what substance somebody puts in their own body. So even if I thought marijuana was a poison, I still would say, you know, the government can't, is not going to be able to stop people and shouldn't try. Uh, the, 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 the marijuana user commits a victimless crime, and uh, it's, a, it's really horrific that we make room in our prison system for people who've done no more than that. I was, remember being on this show with Brian Lamb one morning uh, with um, Richard Brookhiser from National Review, who said that he thought it would probably uh, saved him during his, his own cancer treatment. He, he, as a very strong social conservative, had to just go out onto the open market and get some get some marijuana to get him through. Well, uh, Christopher Hitchens has appeared on our call-in shows about 33 times over the years. We want to show you a montage of those as we take this next call from Las Vegas. I'm sorry, we're taking this next call from New York, New York City. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, Mr. Hitchens, in Martin Amos's memoir, Experience, he recounts an episode in which uh, the two of you are driving and you, something happens and there's a laughing fit that's so overwhelming you have to pull over and sort of weep with laughter. Mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't detail what you guys were laughing at. Do, do you care to share it at this point? I, no, I, I can't. I, I, I'd love to. I can't do that. Why? What a disappointment. Well, I don't have Martin's permission. Who is Martin Amos? Martin Amos is a very brilliant uh, English novelist and essayist, and um, is the son of Kingsley Amos, who I'm sure a lot of your, your viewers will know or will have read, but also um, doesn't, actually isn't printed enough in the United States, but I think every, almost everyone has heard of Lucky Jim, his great classic comic novel. And Martin is my oldest and dearest friend and was we've been best man at each other's weddings and godfathers to each other's children and know everything about each other and it was i'm afraid it was one of those things that we were laughing about and it's i can't do it on a sunday morning to a family audience anyway well in 19, 1999 this is what martin amos had to say about you christopher's always taken up unpopular positions he likes the battle the argument the smell of cordite well i i don't mind that being said at all. I guess it's probably true. The smell of cordite makes me sound perhaps braver than I am. Well, according to your wife, Carol Blue, 
there's a whole tough guy. I am violent. I will use violence. I will take some of these people out before I die talk, which is really key to his psychology. I don't care what he says. I think it is partly due with his upbringing. Yes, I remember wishing she hadn't said that to, the, to uh, someone who wrote my profile in The New Yorker, because as most people who, I think anyone who knows me knows, I actually don't talk like that. But I think what she was trying to say, and I'm actually not sure how well, how, how accurately she was quoted, to be absolutely honest with you. But it is true that coming from a naval and military family and background, um, th there may be something in, in me that I, I don't see myself that wants to uh, live up to my martial forebears. That's, I think that's quite likely. Um, but it doesn't take the form of talking out of the side of my mouth and saying, you're looking at me. I don't, I'm not like that, as you know. Uh, besides being your wife, who is Carol Blue? Um, well, what, what, what else does she need to be? Uh, she's a young lady from California, fifth, fourth or fifth generation California, I think. Uh, was at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, worked for the Los Angeles Times for a while. Did some work in the screenwriting business um, in Los Angeles. Probably hasn't ever quite forgiven me for making her move to Washington, D.C. And where did you meet? In Los Angeles during a book tour of mine. And uh, she's... In 89. And second wife? Yes. Who was your first wife? My first wife was a lady, I suppose still is, I can't say was. You can't, if you've had children with somebody, you can't really get divorced from them, in my opinion. Was, is a lady called Eleni Meliagru, a, a Greek from Cyprus, who I met during the time I was writing, preparing to write my book on, on Cyprus in the 70s. And I still lived in England at that point. And we were married in, uh, must be 1981, and lived in Washington for many years. We have two children born here, Alexander and Sophia. They're, they have now, since then, moved back to London. And you have uh, three children all together? And uh, Carol and I have a daughter called Antonia. And how old are your uh, three children? Alexander will, is 23. Um, Sophia and Antonia will both this month be respectively uh, 18 and, and 14. Why is Cyprus important? So I have two teenage daughters. Are you close? Um, ask them. Yeah, I don't think they know how much I care about them. And that may be partly my fault because if you're a self-employed writer, there's a tendency always to feel guilty any time you're not working because you never quite know when you've stopped because you have, don't have office hours or an employer or anything like that. And I know that sometimes I must, I must seem a bit distracted to them for this reason. And I'm, I'm sure I'll regret it. I already do in some ways. What are your strengths? But they, they, um, they won't be watching this, so I can safely say that uh, they, they, um, they ought to know. They probably do know how, how strongly I feel for them. What are your strengths as a parent? Well, I can cover the bills, I think. And I can... I'm, I'm not bad with the friends they make or bring around. I think, I'm, I think they don't think, oh Christ, I can't bring so-and-so home because, you know, daddy would be so embarrassing. I, do, I have a feeling that, that that bit's all right, which I think is important. Um, I can sometimes make them laugh. Um, I can sometimes help with homework, as long as it's nothing to do with math or science. I, I can do that um, and in, enjoy doing it. And when they needed it, uh, which they've long since ceased to, I would think I was quite a good reader aloud as well. Uh, this is your book on Cyprus, Hostage to History, Cyprus from the Ottomans to Kissinger. Why mm. is Cyprus important? Well, it's important to me because it's a small republic, uh, less than well under a million inhabitants, a, a, a peaceful, democratic population to never, with no chance of ever threatening anybody else and no ambition to do so, just at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. You know, guarding the approaches to the Suez Canal, roughly, and the coast of Israel, um, Syria, Lebanon, and just under the great stomach of Turkey. Though its inhabitants are majority Greek, Greece is quite a long way away. It's never been politically part of Greece. It has always been used as a kind of cockpit 
and colony by other countries and um, finally managed to break away after centuries of being a, a ruled colonially by either Turkey or Britain. <coughs> Please excuse me. Um, and had that period of independence very cruelly cut off by two military actions, both of them, I'm sorry to say, supported by the United States. One, a military coup sponsored by Greece, and second, a mil two military invasions sponsored by Turkey, which have led to a, a terrible refugee crisis to the partition of the country, artificially to the displacement of a lot of refugees. And I thought it was just a disgrace that uh, Europe couldn't do better by its one of its smallest member states. Um, and so I wrote a book saying I thought this was an injustice that should be reversed. And I've, I've done a lot of speaking and writing about it. Next call for Christopher Hitchens, Las Vegas. Uh, good morning, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, I'm calling to ask about your opinion of uh, President Bush and whether or not he is delusional in his uh, belief in God. I'd like to read a, a short quote from Bob Woodward's book, Plan of Attack, page 379, where George Bush is um, discussing his feelings on the day he ordered the invasion of Iraq. And I quote, Going into this period, I was praying for strength <coughs> to do the Lord's will. I'm surely not going to justify war based upon God. Understand that. Nevertheless, in my case, I pray that I be as good a messenger of his will as possible. End quote. Is the president delusional as commander-in-chief in his decisions or not? Thank you. Um, you wouldn't be able to prove it by that. What he's actually saying there is very modest. That's what I understand the Methodist position to be. You get to a certain stage, you, can, you can't do any more. You, you refer the matter upward, if you like, and you say it's in God's hands now. I think it's a pathetic position to hold, but it's not a fanatical one. It's certainly not like those who say, who have in history said, you know, we are doing God's work, God is on our side. Deo Vindice is the motto of the Confederacy, for example or got mit uns, as it's said, on the belt buckles of German soldiers. Uh, they, thought, they thought God was on their side. Bush isn't invoking the, the Lord in that way. He has, um, to take up your challenge about being delusional, uh, deluded himself because of his um, simple-minded Christianity on several other occasions, though. The most notable would be his first meeting with that uh, KGB goon and thug of Vladimir Putin. Uh, where you may recall, the president said, well, I looked into his eyes and I saw he was wearing his grandmother's crucifix and um, I thought, what a great man this must be and what a, what a friend I've got in this fellow. Now, I, I think the president must regret saying that by now, knowing all that we know, and much of what we knew then about Vladimir Putin. And I'd like to know something, by the way. Uh, someone might want to look into this. Has Vladimir Putin been seen wearing that crucifix ever again since, or had he ever been seen wearing it before? Or did his advisors tell him that the President of the United States is such a sucker and such a sap that that would do the trick? In which case, we have a right to reconsider the idea that having a President who's a person of faith is a good thing. Have you met President Bush? No, I haven't. Vice President Cheney? Yes, I have. Yeah. What was that meeting like? It was an off-the-record meeting. And Mr. Cheney's manner is a sort of an off-the-record one anyway, but it was a discussion with a few involved and interested writers and reporters about the balance sheet of of Iraq as it then stood. Um, this is the summer before last. Did you Fairly sobering event, actually. Did you leave there impressed? How did you, how, what were your feelings when you left? He, he gave a very quick as were, executive summary of how he saw the situation, which I thought was extremely well delivered, I have to say. And, and, um, and I think I already used the word sobering. I mean, it was, the news was not in general good, but um, and there was no attempt to make it seem any better. Would you consider Paul Wolfowitz a friend of yours? Yeah, I would. Why? Well, we've been through a certain amount together, um, but we've also talked about things that are not just political. But I, I, th I think of him as a very intelligent and very thoughtful person, and um, and we've uh, we've had some discussions that will always stay with me in very important moments. And because I've had to defend him, this is a, a, perhaps a horrible way to become somebody's friend, but it is what friends are for. I've had to defend him a lot from what I consider to be a campaign of 
for two campaigns of the most hysterical defamation. One about his the role the real role he played in the liberation of Iraq, and second um, his conduct, which I thought was fairly exemplary at the World Bank. I'm also a friend of Shah Ali Riza, his companion. I've known her separately since she was at the National Endowment for, for Democracy. I knew her before I met him. Uh, I think she's an absolutely admirable woman and was treated in the most in the most scandalous way in the, uh, earlier this year. Another call from Las Vegas for Christopher Hitchens. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Am I on the air? You, not anymore. We were going to move on. Like I said before, the Book TV school bus or the big book TV bus has traveled the country going to bookstores and book fairs. We asked people if they had a question for mm -hmm. you. Here's a young woman who had a question for you. Mr. Hitchens, your politics seem to be in a constant state of flux, and I wanted to know how your radically shifting identity politics contribute and affect your work. Thank you. Identity politics, I don't think I have any of. Um, she's right in saying, when I first came on this program, or on, on C-SPAN, I mean. Uh, Brian Lamb uh, asked me what my political position was, and I said I was a socialist, which would then have been true. And he looked politely incredulous and, um, about this. And every time I came on subsequently, he would always say, are you still a socialist? And I would always say, yes, I am. More or less determined, as time went by, not to let him, you know, have the satisfaction of hearing me say no. There did come a time when I was writing my book, which I see you've kindly got here, Letters to a Young Contrarian, when I found that that definition had slipped away from me somehow. I, I, it didn't mean anything to me anymore. And I stopped saying it. This was about 10 years ago by now. And I'm now not a member of any party um, or, or uh, aligned with any political ideology. And I don't think I ever will be again. But I, I don't know if that's necessarily flux to be an independent. There are times when I miss my old left allegiances, um, like, like a missing limb I once wrote, maybe over-dramatizing it a bit, when I do. Uh, and I'm not ashamed of them. I would, I, I would do most of what I did and said, I'd, I'd do it again, sometimes more. But I don't believe now in the possibility of a, of a total overall ideological solution to anything. Would you describe yourself as a contrarian, as many No, I have? hate the word. Indeed, uh, at least I was true to it when, in denouncing the title of the book I wrote, saying I thought the publishers had given it a stupid title. But there has to be, there should be a word for someone who, um, there isn't, unfortunately, who is an independent person of perhaps radical temper who prizes the idea of thinking for himself. It would be nice if we had a word for it. Contrarian isn't it, because... Contrarian would suggest that one went around looking for fights to get publicity, and I, I don't think actually even my worst enemy would say that about me. Anyway, the hell with them if they don't. I want to read an entire chapter from Letters to a Young Contrarian. Okay. How to ward off atrophy and routine, you ask? Well, I can give you a small and perhaps ridiculous example. Every day the New York Times carries a motto in a box on its front page, all the news that's fit to print, it says. It's been saying it for decades, day in and day out. I imagine that most readers of the canonical sheet have long ceased to notice this bannered and flaunted symbol of its mental furniture. I myself check every day to make sure that the bright, smug, pompous, idiotic claim is still there. Then I check to make sure that it still irritates me. If I can still exclaim under my breath, why do they insult me and what do they take me for and what the hell is it supposed to mean unless it's as obviously complacent and conceited and censorious as it seems to be, then at least I know I still have a pulse. You may wish to choose a more rigorous mental workout, but I credit this daily infusion of annoyance with extending my lifespan. Yeah, I still do it. I did it again this morning. There they put it on the front of the newspaper. All the news is fit to print in this bright little box. I mean, the, the, just the credulism of it just never ceases to surprise me. The other thing I do, because I live in Washington, is I check that the Washington Post is still printing a horoscope every day, which they are, unbelievably. I mean, they, are, they print astrological predictions in a journal of record. It's, and I usually remember to fire off an email to, of annoyance to someone to complain, just to make sure you know, that one doesn't get too used to this kind of thing. How often do you fire off that email? Oh, in my mind all the time. I, did, I don't want to get like, um, there's a wonderful Saul Bellow novel called Herzog, but a, a slightly crazed old gentleman called Moses Herzog who just can't stop writing letters of complaint. They're brilliantly written, which is the point of the book, but you don't want to end up like Herzog does.
We touched on this, but I want to come back to it via an email by Matt Poundstone of Denver, Colorado. There's a page in your book, God is Not Great, in which you appear to console the faithful whose beliefs you are shaking to the core with your own experience of becoming disillusioned with Marxism. Mm. From this passage, it sounds as though you really lost your faith later in life as a leftist rather than in the green fields with your teacher as a boy. Is this a fair characterization, and how would you compare your experience with Marxism to those who come to similar conclusions about God? Well, the, the, it's an excellent question, by the way, and I'm grateful to Mr. Panstone, but I just have to differ with him on the, the grammar of his question. Namely, <clears throat> Marxism is not, in the sense he implies it or, or analogizes it, a faith at all. It's a method of thinking. Um, it, which used to claim to be scientific, well, does did claim to be scientific, um, and it, it's, it arises exactly from the quarrel with the idea of religious uh, thinking, which is based on faith. So it, it just isn't to be compared with a religion. Of course, the the communist systems and parties were sometimes compared to churches uh, because of the way they evolved, the, the, the dogmas that they assumed. Uh, the witch hunts that they carried out, the heresies that they condemned, the miracles, mainly economic, that they claimed to have created, and so forth. And there's some truth to that. But I didn't. That I never had any illusion in that to lose. It's just that um, I found in the end that the word the word socialist didn't describe a thinkable future to me anymore. It wasn't a crisis of faith or a dark night of the soul. Honolulu, you're on with Christopher Hitchens. Yes. Well, good morning. It's very, very excited to talk with you this morning. Um, I'm very curious about how you have been able to to write the book that you've written and walk through the the talk shows, uh, especially on the conservative right, and not become the real target of um, bashing. I guess is the most simple way to put it. You seem to be able to remain. Um, at least a neutral um, party as you walk through this. And also, I'd, as a two-parter, how do you feel about some of the interviews that you have and some of the debates that you have with, with people that are so opposed? How, uh, uh, do you develop different opinions of them as, as you listen to their arguments and, and the way they respond to you? And thank you very much. I, I really enjoy you. Oh, please, thank you. Well, I asked my publisher when we started with the book to... Uh, make the book tour as far as possible go through the southern portion of the country instead of the traditional book tour which tends to be New York, Chicago, um, San Francisco, Seattle, LA and so on but to take it to the what people think of as the heartland and, and try at every spot and at every stop to uh, have a debate, challenge somebody, ask the locals to sort of bring out their best advocate for religion and in a remarkable number of places they, they did do that um, and we had some extremely strong, and I think often quite amusing and entertaining uh, public events, some of which were broadcast. And I have to say first that I was very impressed by the general courtesy of people to be willing to have someone come in their midst and challenge their dearest beliefs um, and reply politely. Uh, Christianity Today, for example, asked me to be on its website for an online debate that went on for about eight weeks. I was very hospitable of them. Um, and Hugh Hewitt, um, who is probably the conservative host you have in mind, or was one of them, has had me on for a very, very long time, two hours, perhaps three, with, um, in one case, a, um, a Catholic a teacher at Annapolis, a naval college, um, liter uh, literary, excuse me, a literature teacher, and in the other case, um, a man in holy orders from the Presbyterian Church in Orange County. So, not bad, really. Um, but I hope it doesn't sound churlish, having said all that, if I say that I didn't encounter one new argument or argument that made me think, I wonder what the answer to that is. That may also sound very complacent to me to say. I don't know if it does. I hope not. As I, I, I do try and look for the weaknesses in my own position, and I, I, I will, if I'm challenged by a new point or a new argument, I will force myself to think about it. Then I realized, of course, well, how could there be any new arguments? I mean, th this argument is a very old one. Uh, I shouldn't, there shouldn't be any novelty in it. But if you see what I mean, um, it, 
it's, it's impressive to me anyway to hear people repeating arguments that they very often don't know were discredited centuries uh, past. This is the missionary position, Mother Teresa in Theory and Practice. Mm. And this is a recent article from the New York Daily News, Mother Teresa's Shocking Struggle. What was your reaction to her uh, uh, crisis of faith? I've written an article that's in the current Newsweek uh, about it, which if you'd like to check or if any, anyone is more curious. Um, and it's already up on their website, I believe. Well, I think it's, it's actually extremely interesting because it shows um, that for very nearly 50, the last 50 years, last half century of her life, she really couldn't make herself believe in the, in the presence of Christ in the Mass, the Eucharist, which is the, the central tenet of Catholic faith, almost the sine qua non, and that she felt that when she prayed there was no one listening and there was nothing happening there. Um, my theory is that because this happened just after she got what she wanted, which was to let the church allow her to run her own order. She's a very ambitious woman. The church used to suspect her of ambition and pride and, and overzealousness. It was just after she got permission to start in 48 or so that she had this meltdown. And I think the, the whole life that people think they admire so much of her endlessly uh, working herself to death, apparently, uh, her tremendously ostentatious austerity, professions of poverty, almost masochistic. All of this turns out to be nothing but an, an attempt to drown out the demons. And the church knew very well that this woman who they were using, because she was such good publicity, um, didn't really believe a word of it. So I think it was very cynical on their part. What kind of reaction did you get to the missionary position? Overwhelmingly positive, to a surprising extent, because a lot of Catholics know that there's a danger of fanaticism. Um, and excessive zeal, and it's, it's the greatest danger the church has ever had to face. And she was a perfect example of it. I'll give you an instance. The church, everybody knows, regards the, the unborn child as a real thing, um, as, as a person, so to say, and, and the, ab abominates abortion. As, as a matter of fact, that's my own view as well. I think the concept unborn child is embryologically correct, and that's, that's what it is. Um, and uh, I think abortion is is abhorrent and should be avoided wherever possible. But Mother Teresa, when she got the Nobel Prize for Peace, went to Stockholm. You have to make a speech. You can't just pick up the check. You've got to say something. It has to be about peace. She said, I've discovered the greatest threat to world peace. The greatest threat to world peace is abortion. Now, nobody thinks that. It's impossible to think that. That's a crazy thing to say. It's, a, it's beyond fanatical. The church doesn't demand it of you. People will think, good God, you know, the woman's gone round the bend. Um, that's what I mean. Christopher Hitchens, I want to show you this picture. So and then the second thing, I'm oh, sorry, is oh. this. It's very important. People misunderstand it all the time. She was not a friend of the poor. She was a friend of poverty. She liked poverty. She thought it was good for people. She told people to think of it as a gift from God. And she made sure that they stayed poor because she preached against the only thing mm -hmm. that can abolish poverty, which is the empowerment of women. Give women some control over their own reproductive cycle, particularly with contraception. Give them a uh, uh, chance to get off the wheel of a husband who forces annual pregnancies on them, so many of which are going to die. You do that, you can raise the floor of the poorest village in, in Bolivia or Bangladesh. She spent all her life trying to make sure that could not happen. So a lot of people are much poorer and much sicker and much less well-educated um, and much less happy than they would have been if she had never come on the scene. Is that an argument in favor of capitalism? Not on its own, it isn't. Though, because capitalism doesn't always insist on the empowerment of women, but if, if anyone's interested in the alleviation of poverty, um, that's the, that is the only thing we know definitely works, is giving women control over their reproduction. I want to show you this picture, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, this is in the Washington Post style section oh, yeah. yesterday. And it's a woman praying at the uh, memorial for Diana in England. What do you think about that? What's your reaction? Well, I, that's exactly this, what I say about the, the sickly influence of religious cultism. It, it, is that it, 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 it leads to um, man-made, well, I think, sorry, I'll back up. I think all religious cults are man-made and they, they've created false objects of worship, um, mythical, legendary ones. When you see it happening in front of your eyes, you can see how it got started. 
there you see it happening in front of our eyes. We think that's grotesque, I expect most people do. What are you doing? Praying to an image of a basically disco dancing princess. But it's no more absurd than saying that you think Joseph Smith dug up some gold plates in upstate New York that had angelic writing on them, which is one of the front runners for the Republican nomination claims he believes, or the or the cargo cults of Polynesia, or the belief that um, that after several hundreds of thousands of years of indifference, heaven waited till two thousand years ago to conduct a human sacrifice in Palestine so that we could be forgiven our sins. I mean, as I say, if you believe this kind of thing, you'll believe anything, and you might as well make a goddess of Princess Diana. Springfield, Illinois, you're on with Christopher Hitchens. Good morning, Peter and Christopher. Morning. Um, you were recently on a book panel where your co-panelist, Jonathan Kirsch, I believe, was rebutting a point you had made. And as he was talking, you interjected, it's immoral to love your enemy. Um, you were not given a chance to elaborate on that, so I'm going to give you that chance now. Thank you. I think I can remember the event you're talking about, and I, I think I think it was in Los Angeles, wasn't it, at the book fair? Yes, I don't I don't like being told, especially at a time like this, that it's my duty to love my enemies. People who want to go and love Bin Laden can do, go do it on their own time. They're not to tell me that I'm um, to do the same. Or, and they're certainly not to tell me that that's moral preaching. No, we have to hate our enemies and try and destroy them before they destroy us. That's a responsibility. To, to, to be neutral on, on such a point, especially if you're a father or if you consider yourself a citizen with duties to his fellow citizens, is, is wicked and should be described as such. Christianity is, is a masochistic pabulum in that way. It actually disarms those of virtue and leaves them at the mercy of those who are wicked. This is In Depth with Christopher Hitchens on Book TV. Denver, you're on the air. <coughs> Yeah, hi, I'm Christopher, I'm a big fan. Um, Thank you. I noticed you took some exception, um, maybe even umbrage, at the notion that by invading Iraq, we've given bin Laden what he wants. And I wonder if you'll admit that the problem people maybe were trying to articulate with that statement is that the more or less secular or more or less civilian population of that region might become a larger uh, substrate for these fundamentalist wackos like bin Laden when their civil society is destroyed and they're thrown out of work and their homes and maybe even their families are turned to ash. In other words, all guerrilla campaigns need the support of the population and shouldn't we therefore do two things? One is address the legitimate complaints of the region and thus not increase the substrate for these right-wing fundamentalist guerrillas. And then couldn't we just go after the terrorists themselves? Thanks. You, you probably, since you kind of say read my stuff, you probably know that I'm very dubious about the, the root cause argument with ter terrorism. I don't think that al-Qaeda terrorism comes, for example, from the denial of a Palestinian state. I don't think so. You may have noticed that when the al-Qaeda forces uh, with their Ba'athist allies blew up the UN office in Baghdad to um, murder the great Sergio Vieira de Mello, the, the wonderful Brazilian human rights envoy who Kofi Annan had sent there. They said they'd done it to revenge themselves for his help in getting East Timor uh, independence from Indonesia, East Timor being the, the Christian, formerly Portuguese island that was invaded and uh, illegally occupied by Muslim Indonesia. So you see, if you want to get, if you want to make these people happy and address their, their complaints, you have to say, well, we We'd be better, better off not of liberating. We'd be better off not having liberated. Excuse me. <coughs> East Timor, not a demand that can easily be met. If you really want Al Qaeda to go away, you have to let Pakistan take over Kashmir and tear the heart out of the Indian Federation and start a, a, a horrible religious war in the subcontinent. The the cause of Islamist terrorism, in other words, as I'm saying to you, is the ideology of Islamic terror. That's what it's recorded. There are things we could perhaps have done uh, to, on the substrate point of yours. I certainly think that keeping Iraq under sanctions for a dozen years, where the Saddam Hussein was able to build a palace for himself in every one of Iraq's provinces, 
from the skim-offs of that sanctions racket, while the rest of the people were drinking sewer water, um, did help to create an underclass in Iraq of a kind it they hadn't seen before. It certainly was no help to us or to the secular forces in Iraq when, this, when the situation imploded. But you're not to tell me that people blow up the sewer pipes in Iraq so that they can get better drinking water. Or they blow up the oil pipelines because they're, they're out of a job, because that's the one way of ensuring that they remain unemployed. No, the people who do this, the, the, the revolting jihadists who do it, are not the product of unemployment and poverty. They are the cause of unemployment and poverty. And until you get that distinction completely firmly fixed in your mind, you will always flirt with talking nonsense, as you just very slightly did a moment ago, if you don't mind my saying so. Because of your strong statements against uh, radical mm. Islam, has there ever been a fatwa against you? No, I don't. Have think you I'm ever gotten a threat? Well, there wouldn't really. Well, that's an interesting question. There wouldn't really be a fatwa against me um, in norm, normal Islamic law because I've never been a Muslim, so I, I don't apostatize when I say what I think about the Quran or the Prophet. I dwell in what they call jahiliya, ignorance. It's not my fault. Salman Rushdie, my friend. Uh, got a fatwa against him because he w had been a Muslim and he could be sentenced to death for abandoning his religion because the, not the Quran but the Hadith state very explicitly the penalty for changing your religion is death. Lately it's been a slightly sinister development which is since around the time of the Danish cartoon controversy of last year threats have been made against non-Muslims by Muslim extremists saying if, if you criticize the Quran you should be beheaded whether you're Muslim or not. Now that people haven't noticed, but that actually is crossing an even still more dangerous line. Yes, I did once get uh, a threat, a believable one, at least the State Department counterterrorism office told me that they thought it was believable. It was from Iran. And, um, and they asked me to change my address. And did you? No, because I thought, first, if you start running, you'll never stop. And second, if they know where I live now, it won't be that hard for them to find out where I've moved. Did the um, State Department provide any security or anything? No, for I them? didn't ask them to either. No. Um, and here I still am. Next call for Christopher Hitchens, Miami. You're on the air. Yes, Mr. Hitchens, I enjoyed your uh, love, poverty, and war very much. Thank you. Partic particularly the, uh, the uh, essays on Churchill and the future of an illusion. My, my question is, we have a situation where perverted priests, confidence men such as Pat Robertson, buffoons like Al Sharpton, all these characters build these enormous financial empires, <clears throat> and yet they aren't subjected to taxation like the rest of us, simply because they claim to be in the service of a, of a higher power. Is this ludicrous situation an anomaly to us here in the States, or is it common to the rest of the world? And again, I enjoy your, your work very much. Thank you. Well, it's... it's um it's an unintended byproduct of something that does make the United States unique, which is that uh, Congress, as you know, can make no law respecting the establishment of, of a religion. That's the, it's the most important part of the most important amendment to the Constitution. In the country where I was born, which you can probably tell is England, uh, there's a state church of which the Queen herself is the head. The Queen and her, or whoever is the monarch is uh, ex officio, the head of the church, the head of the state, the head of the armed forces. And, uh, your tax dollars have to go to subsidize that, whether you like to or not. The same is true in Germany, France, and elsewhere, not to quite the same extent. In Germany, for example, you have to pay a tithe either to a synagogue or a Catholic or Protestant church. It's very difficult to say you're not going to choose one, but you, you don't have to choose only one, if you follow me. In America, it's a voluntary effort, and that's why it's allowed the status of charity or whatever the tax exempt definition is which I agree with you, should not be permissible for churches that engage in political activity or political advocacy. I further think that, um, because we're hearing a lot of talk recently about equal time in the argument over so-called intelligent design and creationism, they say they want schools to teach uh, alternatives to Darwin as well, alternatives to the theory of evolution. Well, in that case, any church that is getting a tax break from the government let alone getting any handout from the so-called faith-based initiative, should be obliged to teach Darwin in its Sunday schools and even in its services for equal time and fairness purposes. Don't you think? I pass on the idea. It might cheer you up. When did you become a U.S. citizen? On 13th April this year. 
the, which was my birthday and Mr. Jefferson's birthday. Why? Why that day, or why did why I did you why? become a U.S. citizen? Um, I applied shortly after the attack on the United States in September of 2001. No, not shortly after, not very long after. I, I made up my mind to do so anyway, but then. Um, that and the arguments that came out of it, and the clashes, um, especially the, the with um, certain European powers and forces, made, made me realize that I, I, I had fully a, a come to identify with the country I lived in, with my country of adoption. Um, and as a gesture of solidarity, because I thought I was cheating on my dues, really, if I didn't do it, I ought to take out the papers of citizenship, so I have done. Do you miss England? No, well, I don't have to, in a way, because, I mean, it's only five hours away by plane. I'm going there tomorrow. I have two children there. A lot of my best friends are there. Even if I'm going somewhere else, I always stop there. So, no, I've, I've never regretted leaving, if that's what you mean. No. And since I was quite young, I, I had a very strong impulse to leave and to emigrate to the United States, and I did it as soon as I could. You're, you're well known as a smoker. Is a five-hour flight a long time for you? No, I can go for much longer than that without smoking. It's a funny thing. It's, 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 that's why it's such a stupid habit, and I wish I'd give it up. I don't really need it. I mean, it doesn't bother me now. I used to be able to smoke on C-SPAN, unbelievably. Um, but it doesn't bother me now that I'll be here three hours without, without a drag, no. Well, a couple of emails dealing with... Um... Now, if you'd like to give me a glass of sherry, because we must be getting on towards lunchtime, that would be great. <laughs> We'll see what we can do. A, a, a couple of emails regarding uh, uh, the U.S. and Britain. Please ask Mr. Hitchens to discuss the differences for him in working, writing, communicating in the U.S. as opposed to the U.K. and the rest of Europe. Please ask him to focus on the intellectual and political environment. That's from Sarah Abraham in Philadelphia. And then from Mary Stazer in Oak Harbor, Washington. I have a feeling that British intellectuals come to the U.S. because they see us as easier to influence than the population in Britain. This would make their intellectual life more appealing and their sense of achievement more immediate than if they stayed in Britain. Why is it that mm. uh, we draw draws the likes of uh, Simon Shema, mm. Christopher Hitchens, and Andrew Sullivan to the life in the U.S.? I might add that I am terrifically happy to see them here. Well, you, could, you wouldn't always have necessarily guess she was going to end up like that. Well, um, first to Miss, Miss Abrahams. Um, the, the world I live in, anyway, is pretty much an Anglo-American one. I mean, for example, most of my books are published simultaneously in London and in New York. Um, a lot of the magazines we all like, that people, people like me write for, um, the Atlantic Monthly, in my case, for example, Vanity Fair, very conspicuously, which has a special English edition. Um, the magazines like the Times Literary Supplement or the New York Review of Books are effectively co-produced by British and American academics and intellectuals. It's the, it's um, uh, the, the, you don't feel very much of a contradiction. Um, I think that's also quite true of the academy. The American, the American and British university system is n not unlike uh, itself, each other. More, it's more, more like, the two are more alike than they are to any other comparable one, for example. And of course, there's the common language. So I don't feel very real any, any tension of that sort. It, it's even arguable you know, that it's hardly worth moving, except that I'd prefer the atmosphere here, which I think is more combative and uh, there are more outlets, and there's more uh, opportunity, and a small thing, but not unimportant. It's very much more difficult to get sued for libel. There are fewer restraints on the press than there are in England, and you are under the great roof of the Constitution and the protection of the First Amendment, which gives the, the, the press a certain role of honor, even if it doesn't always discharge it very well in American culture. I know I wrote a book called Blood, Plus, and Nostalgia about the, um, this is to the second question now, about the vulnerability of America to anglophilia, which a lot of people have commented on. There's Hollywood anglophilia, there's a special, there's, I think the music industry the continuously suffers from Brit invasions. There are people who claim to be overawed by English accents. I certainly sometimes get from AT&T phone operators when I'm doing international collect or something, they say, oh, 
love your accent, we should keep talking. And I said, no, it's not me who has the accent, it's you who has the accent. And they, we get along all right. Um, the Diana cult, the cult of the royal family, which completely eludes and escapes me, one of the things I did leave England to get away from was the monarchy, is very strong here too. Um, and, well, it's called English literature for a reason, but, but I would say there was now a separate branch of that called American literature, and everyone should be very proud of it. Los Angeles, thanks for holding. You're on the air. Hi, Mr. Hitchens. Could you talk about the Mershammer and Walt book coming out on September 4th about the pro-Israel lobby and how it pushed us to attack Iraq for Israel and now mm -hmm. doing similar with Iran? And also Thank you, caller. We got the point. That's a regular caller here on C-SPAN. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, I can tell you what I think about it. I think it, I, I probably think that no fair-minded person would disagree with the influence of APAC on policy making in Washington is disproportionate and has been for a long time. <clears throat> An instance I'd give of, of why I think that is that even the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, went on one of his last trips to Washington, said to uh, APAC and various other you know, Jewish lobbying organizations, he looked forward to the time when Israel wouldn't have to depend on this kind of thing anymore, and he, he, he regarded them as advocates not just for Israel, but on the whole for the Israeli right wing, for the, for the more hawkish element within Israel itself. He looked for a declaration of independence by Israel from the Israeli lobby. Well, if he could put it like that, then it's the, the strength of the lobby is clearly not being uh, overestimated. And but my objections to Mills, and Walt are twofold. One, they seem to think it's taken incredible courage from, of them to point this out. Well, they should try it sometime. I've been saying this in print and on the air for a long time. There's an appalling element of self-congratulation with a very slight hint to it that I do not like at all um, of uh, the suggestion, well, you know, the Jews can really take you out if they, if they want to. It's, if there's, there's this huge secret government that they're going up against. I don't like that tone of voice one bit, and that tone of voice is repeated, I think, in the suggestion that we are only at war with Islamic terrorism because of our relationship with Israel. That's not true. That isn't true. If we broke all relations with Israel, and if the whole of what is now Israel became part of the Palestinian state, we would still be uh, having a, a, an extraordinarily uh, harsh and bitter and long-run conflict with the forces of jihadism. Anyone who tries to say, if only we could just dump the Jews, we'd get out of this, is lying to themselves and lying to you, and you should be ashamed of passing that kind of stuff on. Next call for Christopher Hitchens, Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, but, uh, Mr. Hitchens, are you familiar with Karen Armstrong? Uh, slightly, yes. I'm a big fan of hers, and there are many, many other people throughout the world who are. What are the... I think, uh, call, this, call sure we got the right... Um, this is the lady who's written about the Quran and the Bible. Do you know what? We're going to come back. Caller, Cleveland, if you'd turn down the volume on your TV so we don't get the delay. Las Cruces, New Mexico, you're on the air. Yes, hello. Hello, Mr. Hitchens. Hello. <laughs> I congratulate you on being the person who has confused me the longest. Oh. Uh, I'd like to ask you, why, why do you think this government has resisted and continues to resist an honest and independent investigation into 9-11? Um, also, what are your thoughts on Machiavelli, and do you consider yourself more of an entertainer than an intellectual, say, on the level of a, a Noam Chomsky? Thank you very much. Caller, what do you think, uh, what do you mean that 9-11 hasn't been investigated? Well, if, if you remember, the, <laughs> first of all, they weren't going to do an investigation, and then when the, the families of 9-11 and, and the wives um, pursued it, I believe the first person that they... they this government put up was was Henry Kissinger to lead it, and I know Mr. Hitchens has some things to say about Kissinger. Uh, I don't believe, and and almost to a person, everyone I know does not believe there's been an investigation into 9/11. And also, I think it's extremely suspect that <laughs> that what they consider the largest attack on this country, which you could argue. Um, seems to meet with such resistance for an investigation from a government that has nothing to hide about it. Thank you, Carlos. Well, it actually was some, um, yeah, I think it's thanks to me, I'm going I'm to claim it anyway, that Henry Kissinger didn't uh, get to do that job. And, and I bound to agree with, I, I would agree with you. Someone, a president who says, I'd like Henry Kissinger to chair an inquiry, is saying, I want a cover-up. That's, there's only one possible reason that such a disgraced person who's been found to, to have concealed uh, the truth about so many things 
um, and so many disgraceful things, his life could even be considered for such a job. Uh, I wrote a piece saying, well, in that case, quite apart from his other unsuitabilities, we'll have to have him disclose all his client list for Kissinger Associates. You can't hide behind the confidentiality agreements of that anymore. And uh, that call got taken up by the New York Times the next day, and within a couple of days he decided he didn't want the great honor of chairing the 9-11 Commission after all. So although it was only a small point, I think it, I did actually pull out the thread that, that uh, un unpicked his uh, appointment to that post. Uh, I'm not myself aware of any, anything uh, that could be or should be known about this uh, that hasn't been discovered. Um, we, we have a rough picture of first the, the long, long time when the Al-Qaeda forces knew they were at war and we didn't. And that's, this involves repeated failure by our, our establishment at every level to estimate at all the level of the threat. And we know of the unbelievable venality and incompetence of our intelligence organizations, most particularly the, the CIA. What's required now is, a, is a, a separate commission altogether, one that says that our intelligence services are dysfunctional. We, we effectively do not have a central intelligence system anymore. And to my recommendation would be to reopen Senator Moynihan's recommendation that the CIA be closed and padlocked and abolished, and uh, we begin again uh, because it's better to have no intelligence service at all than one that actively works against you. We need to start the whole thing over again. Now you had another question. Do I consider myself more of an entertainer than an intellectual? Uh, well, I'm more, well, I, I don't know uh, whether, which I'd want to be, but I'm pretty sure what, at, at what I'm um, probably better. And I'm much better at stand-up comedy and telling limericks and doing karaoke than I am at any of the other stuff. I just don't get enough opportunities. According to the New Yorker uh, profile from last year, you have uh, filthy jokes that last 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. Cleveland, you're back on the air. Go ahead with your comment. Yeah. You say you are familiar with Karen Armstrong? Uh, yes. Okay. History of God and other articles yes. and other books. I think what I really appreciate about uh, Karen Armstrong's books is that she's so completely objective when she looks at the history of God or religion. And the bottom line is, I don't think God is the problem. <laughs> I think man is the problem. And what's so interesting, when you read her books and see the parallels of earlier history, earlier religions, earlier men, countries, who, was, who combined the two, how all the mistakes and tragedies came about. And bottom line, what she says and other interpretations of her writings are, is basically it's still the good old golden rule. And I think when you take an attitude that you take, which is so negative, you, you keep in, encouraging this us against them again. And it's not that. God is good. It depends on how you're going to as long as you use them for good and not for bad. Um, well, I disagree with you from the very f first thing you said about Ms. Armstrong's objectivity. I, I think you're mistaking her objectivity for her willingness to take religion more or less at its face value. I've read things by her that describe stories from the Quran and the Bible as if they actually occurred, with no evidence that any of them did. Um, you, you, you improve your argument when you say that the problem is man, because after all, God is a man-made invention. Um, but that's, then you can contradict yourself by saying God is not bad in himself. <coughs> he could be good, as good uh, it's easily good as bad, but he can't if he doesn't exist and if he's a human creation and a, a man-made object of veneration. All I'm arguing is that we'd be better off without this construct. We'd be better off without the attempt, which is really all it is, by priests and mullahs and rabbis to establish power in the real world, the only world there is, there is or is ever going to be, by claiming that they have divine authority to do so. We have to challenge that politically, by being opposed to th uh, theocracy and superstition and indoctrination. But we also have to challenge it root and branch by saying that the, the, the authority that it invokes is non-existent. Chris Hedges, June of this year in the New statement, uh, Statesman. Mm -hmm. uh, this is his uh, uh, review of God is Not Great. His assault on what he, you, defines as the irrational force of religion permits Hitchens to sanction the abuse and subjugation of others. This is done in the name of his particular version of goodness, which he calls repeatedly reason. 
But this too is a false god, more particularly the god of death. For once you wage unprovoked wars and embrace torture, for whatever reason you unleash sadists and killers. You become no better than those you oppose. And as an apologist for the war in Iraq, Hitchens not only has the blood of American and British soldiers on his hands, but the blood of a few hundred thousand Iraqis too. Yeah, Mr. Hedges is one of the... I'm sorry, I've got a little a catch in my throat. I'll just get rid of it. Sure. <coughs> Mr. Hedges is one of those rather sinister, creepy people who is a pacifist half the time. Uh, and I've already said why I think pacifism is an immoral position, because it's a, it, it argues for non-resistance to evil. And an apologist for terrorism the rest of the time. Uh, he's, he drops his pacifism when bin Ladenism and jihadism comes up and says, no, you've got to understand that kind of violence because it comes out of despair. I'm not having a, listening to a bar of that song, and as you can see, he can't write, and he can't argue either. Uh, he wrote it in the New Statesman. What's yeah, the my New old Statesman? magazine. Yeah. The New Statesman, <coughs> I am sorry about this, I'm going to have to have some water as well. Tell you what. The New Statesman used to be the flagship weekly of the, not just the British, but in some sense the international, certainly Anglo-American, English-speaking world left, especially in the 1930s. It was a very influential paper, um, started by the Bloomsbury Group, you could say, with John Maynard Keynes, Lytton Strachey, Virginia Woolf, the Sydney Webb, that group. Um, so a lot, a lot of influence on literary culture in Britain and, and the rest of the world as well. Very important in the struggle for the independence of India. When I was young, I wanted more than anything to, to write for it, and I ended up being lucky enough to actually be one of its editors um, until I left England. It's undergone rather a decline now into a sort of um, Michael Moorish, half-baked, um, pseudo-left uh, political apologetics written by, well, by mediocrity. We have a little less than two hours left with Christopher Hitchens on In Depth this Sunday afternoon on Book TV. In about 15 minutes, uh, we're going to take you to some uh, a taped uh, piece where our producer for this show, Cleve Corner, visited Mr. Hitchens at his house here in or his uh, residence here in Washington. We'll show you we'll show you around there a little bit. Mankato, Minnesota. You're on the air. Oh, um, hello, Mr. Hitchens. Um, I'm an admirer of your of your efforts. Um, particularly your literary essays, which I think are perceptive and downright witty. Um, you've, you've introduced you introduced me to some new authors, including uh, Buchanan and Greenmantle. And I'm wondering if you care to um, elaborate on some authors that influenced you, or authors authors that you currently admire. Um, oh yes, well and, thank you. And I thank you. Well, no, I mean, and not that I want to dodge any political questions people, that people have for me, but I was hoping for a slight break from from politics, if possible, because. It's only about half of what I do, and I, I, I do try and interest people in discussions of modern writing and, and literature. Um, in my own case, there are, there are various kinds of influence. The, 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 there's the literary influence that makes one want to be a writer, and then there are the influences that teach you what kind of writer you might possibly choose to be. Um, I. <laughs> I don't know where to begin as to say which was the most influential author. I can remember the, the dystopian writers, um, Wallace Huxley, uh, Brave New World, George Orwell, 1984, Arthur Kersler, Darkness at Noon, had a big influence on me when I was about 14, 15 in the, in the early 60s. Um, all, of, all, all of Orwell's work eventually had that effect on me. Um, in a completely different vein, the work of uh, P.G. Woodhouse, and even war, the great comic geniuses of Britain. I'd probably reread most of that at some point every year, over the course of the year. Um, a, a writer called Conor Cruz O'Brien, 90 this year, amazing man, Irish diplomat, Irish um, politician, Irish essayist and academic, wrote a book called Writers and Politics, which I, I read in 1967 when I was teaching at a little school in England, and um, I remember thinking very, very distinctly that I'd like to be able to write like that and on topics of that sort. If you get hold of writers and politics, you'll see what I mean. I'm sorry I'd have to go on for so long answering this question properly that I would bore everyone, including you. But the thing, the advice I could give people and the advice I try and follow myself is continue to test yourself against a newer and better or if you like older and better uh, writers, but keep keep expanding your library 
and your horizons so that you you keep on being forced to ask yourself the question, why do I bother? Uh, you read, read people who make you feel ashamed to be mentioned even, even in the same breath. Vladimir Nabokov, for example, makes me feel like that. Saul Bellow sometimes, I think, ah. Um, I'm not I'm not fit to read these people. We showed a list of some of the favorite writers that oh, you did. submitted to us while while you were talking. I meant to put Conor Cruz O'Brien on that, so I'm glad I got a chance to mention him now, because I, I remember being annoyed I'd left him off. A couple of books that you've uh, either uh, that you've edited or written: um, Left Hooks and Right Crosses, a decade of political writing. Some of the writers that you include in here: are Susan Sontag, Tony Kushner, Tucker Carlson. Yes. That was a, that's a collaboration between myself and Christopher Caldwell, who is a very clever conservative writer for the Weekly Standard. It was produced by Nation Books, and we, we picked each other's, um, from the opposite left-right position, we picked the favorite writers we had from the other side to see whether we could get the cream of left-right polemical writing. And who so I must have picked Tucker. Why? Do you know, I can't remember what the piece is now. I hope he's not watching. It's, although all this is pre-9-11, it seems like so long ago to me. I'm, I hope Tucker will forgive if I say I don't remember which piece we'd pick from him. And another book I want to... But I do remember telling Tucker I wish he wouldn't give up writing for TV. And I hope, I hope he sometimes hears the, the distant, hollow echo of my voice. Tucker, don't do that. Don't do it. Another book, 2001, published, Unacknowledged Legislation, Writers in the Public Sphere. Yes, I'm very proud of that one. It's, the, it's all my favorite writers, and in the sense of those who are great writers in themselves, um, who don't think that writing should be politicized, or who merely write political prose either, or polemical prose, but who do understand that politics is part of culture and part of life and is a responsibility. And so, and so do feel some obligation, if you like, to, to take part in it. One of the chapters in this book, in defense of plagiarism, yeah. talking about the spectator. What is the spectator? What do I say about the spectator there? Uh, you, the right. you write that, uh, how many years? I wrote a strangely neglected book. Oh, on yes, the yes, sir, that's right. I got a review. I got accused of plagiarism in yes. the spectator. That's yes. right, yes. No, I'm, I'm, I take the view that plagiarism is um, inevitable. Everybody does it. Um, it's impossible not to use other people's words. The, the, uh, the, the respectable thing to do is to try and return what you've borrowed, if possible, with a bit of interest and always with a, an acknowledgement by way of a thank you. That's... But we're all doing that. The, the, there should be another word for those who literally snip out of other people's books, paragraphs and pages and chunks and paste them into their own. That's a neurotic thing, a bit like kleptomania, um, and bound always to be found out, which is why there's about you know, one or two scandals a year about it. The one line in here that you write, and then we'll move on to the next call. Once again, I found myself writing, and once again, revoltingly, without any suggestion of payment, a letter to the editor of this irresponsible magazine. Kenny Oe Bay, Hawaii, you're on the air. Aloha, Mr. Hitchens. Aloha. I, I can't believe I got through it. I've been trying for years to reach you every time you're on the show. And I just wanted to say I admire your intellect and your wit. And Very you think you will ever be tried as a war criminal? And what, about, and what about impeaching Bush? You don't want much, do you? Well, um, Henry Kissinger has been asked, since my book came out, and it's been translated into several languages now, calling for him to be tried on charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity. He has been, to a certain extent, inconvenienced. He was... Um, he was summoned by a judge, uh, a judge named Roger Lelois, when he was in Paris uh, about three years ago, um, uh, not for indictment, but just to, be, for, to answer some questions. This was about Chile and some missing French people in Chile. Um, he didn't answer the summons and left town. He's been asked for, to answer questions also on very grave allegations of, of human rights violations from judges in um, uh, Argentina, a Judge uh, Rodolfo Corral, and in um, in Chile, uh, 
And there are other countries, too, where I know he wouldn't care to travel without a, a lawyer going with him, at least. And I a couple of countries, I think he quite definitely has decided he's not going to try and travel to at all. So it's not nothing, but I, I have a terrible feeling justice is not going to catch up to him, I, in the sense of seeing him in, in a dark. I don't know what impeachable offense you have in mind for President Bush. You didn't say. Uh, she also said that she's been trying to reach you for years. According to everything written and according to being on 33 call-in shows, uh, you're quite accessible yes. to people. And you, you do lectures. Why do you do I'm in, I'm in the phone book as well. I'm in the phone book um, in Washington, D.C. I must be the only Christopher Hitchens who is. And I'm, it's in who's who as well, my home address and my phone number. Well, I think if you spend as much time as I do inflicting yourself on the public, then you are obliged to be where, where they can get back to you if they want. Furthermore, very often people don't just want to give you an earful of their own opinions or their own criticism, but they want to tell you, look, there's this book that I've come across that you might like, or there's this story I read in a local paper that might have got missed, might have escaped your attention, would you be interested? I, I get quite a lot of that too, as well as, you know, some of the few obscenities and the occasional threat um, and the odd crackpot. But it, uh, on the whole, I, I enjoy my mailbag and my email bag and my uh, voicemail bag too. Next call for Christopher Hitchens, Erie, Pennsylvania. Hi, good afternoon, gentlemen. Hi. Um, I have a question. Uh, while I agree with Mr. Hitchens that um, certain religions have um, misused um, the interpretation of what God wants, and they kill and they behead, um, I'm wondering, doesn't he think that there are certain um, parts of all faiths that have good uh, secular um, responsibilities to keep order in the society? For instance, marriage. Uh, for 4,000 years, marriage between a man and a woman committing to each other and then to their children has been the best um, social um, uh, tradition to keep families and then societies healthy. And we, when we abandon that in the 60s in our country, we see that, you know, we have 400,000 dead of HIV and many other uh, STDs. We have youth growing up without fathers, and we know that 70% of the men in prison came from homes with no fathers. We have a lot of instability with uh, secular godless uh, traditions. So um, I'm wondering if in his estimation, which uh, if he says, you know, that all religions were man designed, well, anything he comes up with obviously is designed by man also. So what would he do hmm. to keep a secular but um, incorporate things like not stealing and not murdering and marriage is good for society in whatever his new religion would be. Okay, good. I mean, the except for, again, I'm sorry, I, I just have disagree very slightly from your uh, premise. I don't say these things are done in the name of religion or that they, these atrocities that you admit do occur. Um, or that they are a misuse of religion. Or I say they're done by religion and because of it. I, I don't accept the excuse that, they're, that they are uh, misreadings of, uh, of the text. Uh, but you, you, you catch me out quite neatly when you say, it's, if it's a criticism to say that religion is man-made, then what of any other man-made proposal? Well, I, all, all I say is we shouldn't delude ourselves, that we shouldn't pretend that we are not evolved mammals, that we should not it's 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 grandiose and d delusional to say uh, that there's a divine plan for us and, and that our sins can be forgiven us and so forth. But I also think it's immoral because in, in in such a case, what's the incentive to find out what virtue is or what the good would be uh, if if your responsibilities can be taken away from you and dumped onto um, a heavenly dictatorship? Um, I think you'll find that almost all societies do evolve a form of marriage and always have done and always will. There have been bad times of fluctuation, but after all, the crisis in the American marriage seems to have come out of the period when, the, when religion had it all its own way in the United States. So you can't blame me for it. I mean, it's, it, it seems that there are the other forces at work. Uh, the golden rule, which a previous caller mentioned, uh, in other words, that one should treat others as one hopes to be treated oneself, even though it's a bit of a tautology, is a reasonably good 
and unhistorical moral guidance, one that everyone can understand. My challenge, the way I've been putting it in my various debates around the country is this. Think of a good action performed, or a right action performed, or, or a moral statement made by a religious person that could not have been performed by a non-religious person, a, a non-believer. I don't think you can come up with one. But I'll let it sink in. I haven't yet had an answer to that challenge. But if I ask everyone who's watching this or listening to it, can they think of a wicked thing done, an evil thing done or said because of religion, because of their faith by a person of faith, and nobody has to hesitate for a second. Everyone can think of one. I rest my case there. Raleigh, North Carolina. Hello, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your uh, presentation at the upcoming uh, Atheist Convention in uh, Crystal City, Virginia, in the oh, yes. September. Um, my question is, do you think the growing uh, atheist uh, movement will eventually gather enough uh, momentum to elect uh, professed atheists on a national uh, level, and are there any lessons we can learn from our European counterparts? Thank you very much. Well, by national level, I mean, I think that that's already happened. I mean, the people like Professors Richard Dawkins or Daniel Dennett are, I would say, pretty much national figures now, at least among educated people, if that doesn't sound snobbish, um, doesn't meant to. Um, um, and pro actually, I think would, one could say we're national figures in, even in the world of celebrity, if you have people who are well known. Um, so that's a start. If you mean at the political level, um, yes, it, it's, it's, it, it's problematic, but I think the, the opinion polls that we get played back to us all the time are, are entirely false. I don't think people are telling the truth about the level of their own belief or the level of their own dislike for unbelief. I think all the evidence is that there's quite a change in the zeitgeist away from ostentatious religious belief at the moment. Part of that's to do with the collapsing scenery of the Bush administration. Hideous things like the religiously motivated interference in the private life of the Shivo family, for example, or the uh, other sort of faith-based follies of some of the president's rhetoric, the irritating habit of saying, God bless America at the wrong moment. Think small things like that, the, the terrific menace of jihadism that everyone understands, um, the abuse of American aid by Israeli settlers to try and bring on the Messiah on the West Bank, uh, trying to bring on an, an apocalypse. A, a whole cluster of things, I think, that have made the atmosphere a lot more hospitable to those who are prepared to say, you know what, I don't think that God is taking an interest in our quarrels at all. I think we would be much, we'd be immediately nearer to solving them if we made that assumption. Um, and there would be, and there is no case where a secular society isn't superior to a theocracy. Uh, you can read it off as if it was a graph. So, then the question is, okay, could someone like that get elected president? I don't know. But I think if a person of average honesty and integrity and political skill, who had established a, a decent enough reputation on the issue, was to say, look, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm unconsoled by any faith, have no invisible means of support, I don't, I'd be very interested to see. I don't think many people would say, well, in that case, you can't be a good man. How does Mrs. Watts fit into that? Mrs. Watts was a good old lady. But she was, whether she knew it or not, she was telling, teaching false, falsehoods to children, which is not a good thing to be doing. Religion often makes good people do bad things. Joe Wright emails in, I greatly enjoyed your views on religion and other matters. I'm a big fan of Robert G. Ingersoll, whose works I read as a teenager and whose mm. works were fundamental to, my, to forming my view that all religion is irrational, if not outright evil. I was already at 10 years old an atheist. What influence, if any, did Ingersoll and the great British free thinkers, Chapman Cohen, for example, have on you? But Chapman Cohen much more. I have, I have two books of essays by Chapman Cohen called Essays in Free Thinking. A brilliant guy. He was uh, one of the successors of George Bernard Shaw, I think, as the, the, the National Secular Society in London. A very witty and a very trenchant essayist. And from him, from reading Cohen, I learned about Ingersoll, who it, it amazes me to find has been almost airbrushed in American history. I mean, there was a time in the late 19th century when he was really a national figure, part of, for other reasons, his gallantry in the Civil War, various other attributes he had. But he was a great teacher and proved that you could mobilize large crowds to challenge religious authority. And a wonderful essayist and, um, and writer, too. It would, be, it would be good to have a revival. Some publisher should, should um, do themselves and us a favor and, and, and stage an Ingersoll revival. I think right about now would be a good time for it. 
Uh, Marie Stitt emails in, you pride yourself in being well informed historically and have accumulated vast quantities of arguments of religion as dysfunctional. Are you equally versed in the functions of religion? Do you have a theory as to why the Christian Bible has been cherished over the centuries? Yeah, I, could, I certainly have a theory of why the one that I know best has been cherished over the centuries. Uh, I don't know which one she clings to, but I mean there are several. Most Christians are very amazed to find how many versions of the Bible there are. Um, and you remember there was a famous woman governor of Texas who said, um, if English was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. But the, the best version of the Bible in English, in my view, is, this, is the King James uh, Version, ludicrously in the, referred to as the St. James Version in the New York Times the other day. It just shows how uh, far things have slipped in our educational standards. But that's a translation, almost the only decent work of literature there's ever been um, that's the result of the deliberations of a committee. Quite a, about ten men. Um, I suppose you could say the Declaration of Independence was written by a committee. But apart from that, there aren't many great works produced that way. Hour and a half left in in-depth. I was just going to oh, say, sorry. if you don't, well, the, for me, the, the function, since you ask, is this. If you don't know the cadences of the King James's Bible, the King James Bible, I should say, then a lot of Shakespeare and Milton and John Donne and other things would be unintelligible to you. Um, you, ha you have to know it to understand your own language. And um, that's what I think is the principal function. I think biblical literacy is very important. We'll be back to take your calls after this visit to Christopher Hitchens' residence in Washington. This um, building is almost exactly 100 years old. It's 101 years old now. A very fine old building called the Wyoming, from the great days of the fin de siècle gentleman's apartment building in, in Washington. And this apartment, which wraps around the whole of the top floor, was originally built with this wonderful flooring that you can see, this wooden floor, which means well, it's almost like an ice rink. That's why I don't have any furniture, because I like sort of just rolling around it. Um, by, the, by the architect of the building himself, for his own occupation. And I think that the great distinction of this apartment while I've been in it was that it was used by Clint Eastwood to film Absolute Power, actually one of his less good movies. It, it's about an art thief in Washington, D.C. who needs a safe house. And the presidential motorcade goes up Connecticut Avenue. We often hear it uh, somewhere central. And I uh, came back, having lent the apartment to the movie makers to find that all these walls were covered with uh, knockoff paintings of the treasures of the National Gallery that the Clint Eastwood character had stolen. And I was really hoping that the producer would let me keep them, but he had to take them all away. My hood could be described, and maybe a realtor would want to describe it as Calorama, because it sounds pricier, but actually I think Calorama is the other side of Connecticut Avenue. It's what we call Embassy Row. Diplomatic buildings, residences, woods, gardens, very beautiful, pretty costly. Then if you break to the right out of my front door and go along Columbia Road, you come to Adams Morgan, sometimes called Madam's Organ, to indicate that it's our sort of Bohemia, our Latin Quarter, our little West Village, if you want. So diplomacy on one side, um, Guatemalan music, um, Ethiopian restaurants, etc. on the other side, and then down Connecticut Avenue, straight to DuPont Circle, bookstores, cafes, restaurants, perhaps three Starbucks. So what you're seeing behind me is a sort of confluence of, of Washington, D.C., our nation's great capital. That's Connecticut Avenue, this north-south artery that runs, in effect, from the White House up to Maryland, crosses Massachusetts Avenue a bit lower down at DuPont Circle. That's the sort of radial axis of the city, you might say. Due west there is California Street. And this is Columbia Road curving around to our uh, Adams Morgan district. There's the Russian trade mission. Um, I'm told that there is still a, an apartment in this building run by the National Security Agency to monitor the goings on there from the days of the old uh, Soviet Union. You probably can't see it behind me, but um, on the horizon is the Russian compound. And those domes you see in the woods are the um, Naval Observatory buildings on the grounds of which, of course, lives the Vice President. And then you see the British Embassy just in front of that, 
which is the extreme west end of Massachusetts Avenue, Embassy Row. So it's, uh, it's a, a good reminder of the small size and centrality of District of Columbia. And then there in the middle on his horse is General McClellan, uh, President Lincoln's worst general, the man from, from whom he at one point asked to borrow the army since the general appeared to have no use for it and probably was a defeatist. He, he certainly ran against Lincoln later as a, a pro-slavery Democrat, may have had secret sympathies with the other side. It makes me laugh anyway because on his horse he's still pointing south in the wrong direction. The Confederates would have been that way. He's riding away from them. Um, oh, a little reminder of, of, uh, of our history. A typical writing day for me depends on how atypical the previous day was in that I tend to work late at night and if it's been successful I may not have gone to bed till three so the next writing day will probably not start till say noon or so on but if, it, if you absolutely had to average a day it would be like this um, get up try and inhale some coffee forcing myself to eat oatmeal for cholesterol purposes or anti-cholesterol purposes blah blah before lunchtime I wouldn't get much done except answering emails um, and fending off whatever had you know, accumulated. Um, the world of telegrams and anger, as Ian Forster puts it, just coping with that, and then having lunch, which I usually do reading by myself, because I think the essential thing for being a writer is being a good reader. The main thing, as I keep saying, never tire of saying this, is to keep testing yourself against other writers who are better than you. That's what qualifies one as a writer, I think, is permanently running the risk of having to say, I don't know why I bother. I think there are certain authors of whom one should have you know, all, all their books, even if you can go and borrow them from the library. Um, so I, I know I have in this, in this apartment every single word George Orwell ever wrote, for example, including his expenses reports to the BBC, the lot. Everything that's ever been published by him anyway. Um, most of uh, Marcel Proust, um, most of James Joyce, not all of P.G. Woodhouse, because actually I have to say that there, there are some books of his that aren't that worth keeping. I, I, it seems almost blasphemous to say that, but, I, but The Cream of Woodhouse, I thought, Evelyn Waugh, um, Karl Marx, Leon Trotsky, um, Nabokov. It's a bit eclectic, as you see. Salman Rushdie, Martin and King's Namus, Ian McEwan. I have pretty much all of what they've written. I would, I like to think that I have a life rather than a job or than a career. And it's all to do with reading and writing. The only two things I was ever any good at, and public speaking, which I can also do. And that's how I make my living. But it's, it's also what I am, who I am, what I love, um, and fortunate at that because there's nothing else I can do. It's not as if I could have been a lawyer or a doctor and I chose this, it chose me.
Christopher Hitchens, another one of your books, Why Orwell Matters. Why does he matter? And who was he? George Orwell was an Englishman um, born in 1903. The book came out for what would have been his centennial. He actually only made it just into the second half of the 20th century. He died in January 1950, just after completing what was probably his best-known book, uh, 1984. Um, what, what else was he? He was uh, born into the sort of upper middle class, but not with any money or capital. His father had been in the opium business in between British India and British China. He was, in a sense, an imperial drug dealer. Um, Orwell briefly worked for the empire as a policeman in Burma before deciding that he found imperialism disgraceful. Um, and from then on, identified basically with the victims of the British system. You know, became for a while a, a tramp. Um, an odd job, low-page menial worker, a low-wage menial worker, excuse me. Um, when fascism came, he went to Spain and volunteered to fight in defense of the Spanish Republic. Uh, got involved with a leftist militia that was opposed to the Communist Party in Barcelona. Got shot in the throat by the fascists, very nearly got shot in the back by the communists, and wrote a wonderful book called Homage to Catalonia, uh, the best book written about the Spanish Civil War. Out of these experiences, the reason I say he's important, why he matters, is that of all the writers of the 20th century, when the, the, the big three issues of that century were fascism, communism, and imperialism, Orwell was the only one to have analyzed all three of them correctly, in effect. And that would be my view. With no more resources than the, a person of average integrity and intellectual honesty can bring to bear. He never had a steady job. He never had a steady publisher or a proper uh, outlet. Was often his books were banned or suppressed, or his articles were not un went unpublished. So he's, he's my exemplary case of, of how much a single individual with, with a bit of nerve and a bit of literary ability can, can do in a very short life, 46. If, if he were alive today, who would he be writing for? It's impossible. I have played that game, and you can up to a certain point, and people do, because of his reputation for integrity, and, and prescience. A lot of people want to invoke him and have him on their side. I don't think it's relevant to ask any more because he would, he would be more than 100 now. So the game stops, I think, a bit before that. I think, for example, uh, Norman Pod Horitz, who's another admirer of Orwell um, and, um, shall I say, rival of mine, we, Mr. Pod Horitz and I don't agree on things. Um, he says, for example, he's sure Orwell would have taken the American, the, the, the Johnson position, let's say, on, on Vietnam. I'm practically certain that he wouldn't. And he could have lived that long <coughs> because he was very, very hostile to colonialism in Asia, particularly the British, but even more so, perhaps, the French. And I, I think he would have he would understood very clearly that the origin of the Vietnam War is the attempt by the United States to resuscitate French colonialism in Indochina and then to succeed it. Well, he wouldn't have been in favor of that to begin with. He wouldn't have thought it was um, a worthy enterprise, to the contrary. So I think one can, to that extent, predict some of his moves. Um, but most of the real political positions he, um, he took are all you need. You don't need to speculate on what, what he might have thought. It's enough to know what he did think. And more important, how he thought. And basically, what he did was educate us especially in a wonderful essay called Politics in the English Language, which, was, which will be f 50 years old, I think, this, I must check, this year. Um, educators in, uh, no, it must be more than that, I'm sorry. Educators to see through the ways in which language is misused as propaganda. Uh, just prior to our discussion now, we showed some of your favorite writers. And I'm sorry, it must, be, it must be 80 years or something since the Polish Constitution. I know it's an anniversary this year. Excuse me. No problem. We showed some of your favorite writers. P.G. Woodhouse, English novelist, is listed there. Emailer, will you please tell the C-SPAN audience why Woodhouse matters? Yes. Uh, well, there are, in literature, there are a couple of, everyone knows, double acts. Imperishable characters, Sancho Panza and Don Quixote, um, Sherlock Holmes, and Dr. Watson. Uh, for my money, though, um, Bertie Wooster and his manservant, uh, Jeeves, is really the locus, locus cascus here. The, the dialogue between those two men and the adventures that they undergo together 
I just think it's a class by itself. The, the one to read, if you can only pick one, the, the full-length novel to read, because um, there are many, many short stories, uh, would be The Code of the Worcesters. The absolute genius. Couldn't possibly be without it. We're going to put the phone numbers back on the screen in case you care to participate in our conversation with Christopher Hitchens on In-Depth this afternoon. If you live in the East and Central mm -hmm. Time Zone, 202-737-0001 is the number for you to call. If you live in the Mountain or Pacific Time Zones, 202-737-0002. BookTV at cspan.org is our email address. Another email, this is from Barry Friedman in Tulsa, mm -hmm. Oklahoma. I have this running debate with my in-laws, good Republicans all, over whether your hatred for the Clintons is greater than your disdain for Bush. Huh. Well, it's not really hatred for the Clintons. It's, well, I'd prefer to say contempt for them. That's the, the, I mean, there was a, a fashion at the time for what was called Clinton hating, and often took a rather paranoid form. I didn't regard myself as part of that. It was contemporary. And for, for the president, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the word would be. Because you see, on on I'm a single issue voter, and on the on the main point, which is the incompatibility between us and any totalitarian or terrorist system or state, I think he's essentially right. I mean, I think he he feels that that has to be fought. I don't think he's particularly good at doing it, but that's a second order question for me. And of, and of course, I do have disdain. And, and contempt and sometimes hatred for his for his awful piety and for his his um, silly blatherings about faith as if faith was a virtue in itself which I simply don't think it is if I come to you and say hey I'm willing to believe a whole lot of extremely important claims without any evidence at all now will you respect me I'm, I would say no I would expect the answer no if I was saying it myself next call for Christopher Hitchens <coughs> St. Louis you're on the air Hi there. Good afternoon. Uh, well, you just said the first thing I can agree with. I, I didn't vote for Bo George Jr. or uh, President Clinton either. We could have done without both of them. But I want to talk first about Mother Teresa. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got that. Okay, Mother Teresa, three things. First of all, she may have felt God's presence in her life <laughs> for a long time. You know, that's between her and God as far as I'm concerned. But... She was inspired by God uh, to begin her mission to the sick of Calcutta, and she never denied that it was God that it, her, inspired her. Uh, secondly, um, the fact that, that we sell these high-tech weapons and financially have supported leaders like Hussein and the royal family of uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, to keep the oil flowing in these, from these countries, uh, while they were having anything but democracies, that, that is why these people hate us. Why don't people say the truth about why they hate us? And last, you know, it's a sad day when regardless of the fact that most Americans want us out of Iraq, believe it was a mistake, as long as the military-industrial complex, the American-Israeli lobby, and big business, they all contribute heavily to the politicians' campaigns, and these same outfits advertise in the media, and, and uh, they want us in Iraq. So until they're ready to get us out of there, I'm afraid we're going to be there, and it doesn't much matter what we think anymore. Thank you, caller. A lot of ground to cover. No, it's, it's not a question. It's just, I take it as a statement. Now we know what she thinks. We also know how she thinks. Uh, George Sim Johnston in the National Review said this about the missionary position. Mr. Hitchens is made uneasy by the thought that somebody somewhere is doing a good deed motivated by personal charity rather than statist ideology. <laughs> Mother Teresa's Roman Catholicism also bothers him because it's obscurantist and retrograde, unlike, say, Marxism in the 1990s. Well, you see, he's got me wrong twice because I don't say that she was doing a good deed for the wrong reasons. I, I don't think her work in Calcutta was good. She raised an enormous amount of money around the world from people like he, who naively thought that the money was going to give breakfast to starving children or medicine to people in need. And she used all the money to build up this, on her own confession, on her own admission, convents in her own name. That's where most of the money went. She had a hospice for the dying where a few nuns not trained in medicine of any kind 
were found occasionally with uh, the odd syringe, which they were washing in cold water. It was a place we, purely for death, a house of death, and based on a cult of death, too. As I've told you before, she preached that poverty was a good thing. She did her best to, uh, to make sure there was a lot of it by arguing that women shouldn't be allowed to have contraception, shouldn't be allowed to be divorced from abusive husbands. Um, she preached the most fanatical form of Catholicism, uh, a much more dogmatic one than the Church itself professes, and as I've just said, or said in reply to an earlier question, this fanaticism seems to have been an attempt to overcompensate for the fact that she couldn't in, in private believe any of the central postulates of the religion. So really it's a pretty shabby career, and I, I, it's not my problem, of course, but if I were a religious person, um, I wouldn't um, choose her as the exemplary figure of my faith because it's too easy and anyone who can read my book can find out how easy it is to show that none of the things popularly believed about her are true whereas a lot of very unpleasant facts that have never been denied her taking of money for example from the um, Duvalier family dictatorship in Haiti where I think everyone would agree the poor of the world had one of the worst deals they've ever had stolen money in effect um, her shabby dealings with Charles Keating of the Lincoln Savings and Loan, um, her refusal to return stolen money from him even when the courts in America asked for it back or gain on behalf of the poor from whom it had been robbed. All of this is all true and can be proved. Um, the people who say she, was, she did all this in the, because she felt she had a light from Jesus and so on are saying what they cannot prove and is very probably in any case not true. What do you think uh, uh, that reviewer meant about Marxism? Why do you think he brought oh, that Oh, I think that's that? a dig at your humble servant. Why? I think it's intended as a dig at your humble servant, I mean to say. Well, of course, if you, if you have a background as a Marxist, as I do, of, if you attack someone else's ideology as, um, as outmoded or primitive, then you, you are living in some extent a glass house. Email, Steve Finnefrock, Hollywood Conservative Forum. Look, as I might, it's yet to be found that you've explicitly renounced your once famous adoration for communism and its adherents. Your recent excellence in explicating the Iraqi war is commendable, but we still await an explicit renunciation of communism, including the beloved Uncle Ho Chi Minh, the Viet Minh, et al. ad nauseum. Well, you have to keep on waiting, won't you? I'm not going to denounce the Viet Minh. Viet Minh should have become the government of Vietnam in 1945 would have saved everyone a great deal of trouble if they had. Wouldn't it have been beautiful? We know what the, we know what the model of communism was that they probably had in mind and um, the gentleman just hasn't read enough of my stuff to know what I think about that but it was nonetheless it was the it would have been the it was the natural outcome for the lot for the struggle of the Vietnamese to expel the Japanese and unify their their country. Wouldn't have been done by any other group. We talked about this a little earlier but uh, just in case viewers are just turning, tuning in, Doug Tarnapal emails, how do you explain your about face from courageous left-winger to obsequious neocon? P.S. In case you reach for the Orwell mantle in your answer, I've read Orwell, I've appreciated George Orwell, and you, sir, are no George Orwell. Well, he, then he would know that uh, every time the mantle questions come up, that I've uh, said, don't be stupid. I mean, listen, George, I have... I'm, well, for one thing, I've, I'm more than 10 years older than Orwell was when he died. Um, and I've made a pretty, pretty good living out of journalism. Orwell was always broke, but never sold out on the point. Orwell was a volunteer soldier in Spain, took a bullet in the throat. I haven't been as courageous as that. I've never had to sacrifice much to censorship or, or poverty or oppression. And I don't write as well, either. And I, I can't write novels at all. So... Um, the mantle thing is simply a sneer, as actually, come to think, it was the rest of the question. Um, you said that you've made a good living as a writer. Are you wealthy? No, I'm not, but I'm, I get paid more than I need to pay the bills. It took a long time to get, uh, stopping living from check to check. But I, I mean, I'm, I didn't mind that either, because I'm, I'm doing the only thing I know how to do. So it, was, it isn't as if I could have done something else for a living. It was, there's nothing else I'm fit to do. Besides your books, uh, you also write for Vanity Fair. But I mean, you know, this, my current book is on the bestseller list, so I, I will, I'll see some money from that. Um, besides your books, you write for Vanity Fair? Yeah. On a contractual basis? Anyone else? 
I, I contributed an essay on books to the Atlantic Monthly. <coughs> Not absolutely every month. Um, I think about 10 months a year. Fairly regularly, anyway. That's a lovely job. What's your relationship with Graydon Carter? Well, Graydon and I were friends before he became editor of Vanity Fair. And I used to write for him a little when he was at the New York Observer. And um, we've, we've been very tight for a long time. We have quite similar tastes in literature, not in politics. I mean, again, P.G. Woodhouse, even war, things like that. We, we, always, we always have some chat about that whenever we meet. Um, he's got a better dress sense than I have. He's always trying to get me to put on a tie and generally smarten myself up. But, and he and very nicely, he asked me to, to come and write for him the first day I think he was appointed. So I've been doing it now since, gosh, 92. It's going to be 15 years quite soon, I th now I think about it. What's your relationship with the nation currently? I simply don't have one. I still have some friends there, but I mean, after doing a column for almost, <coughs> excuse me, almost exactly 20 years called Minority Report, I got to the stage where I had gone well beyond diminishing returns. I, I just was essentially through with the mentality that makes the United States the author of its own troubles in in the matter of the war with the jihadism. I just I have no no patience with that mentality of any kind anymore. Is Katrina Vanden Heuvel a friend of yours? Yes, uh, as long as she says so. Uh, there's no reason why uh, we shouldn't consider ourselves friends. I haven't seen her for a bit. This is from your The Nation uh, column. In October 8th, 2001, the bombers of Manhattan represent fascism with an Islamic face, and there's no point in any euphemism about it. Why they abominate, what they abominate about the West, to put it in a phrase, is not what Western liberals don't like and can't defend about their own system, but what they do like about it and must defend. It's emancipated women. It's scientific inquiry. It's separation of religion from the state. Loose talk about chickens coming home to roost is the moral equivalent of the hateful garbage emitted by Falwell and Robertson and exhibits about the same intellectual content. Yes, that was the week when the ridiculous uh, now uh, departed uh, Jerry Falwell and the even more repellent Pat Robertson, two complete rogues who just prove what you can get away with in this country if you can get yourself called reverend, had gone on the air while the, the cell phones were still bleeping under the rubble and you could still smell the stench of it all in downtown New York to smugly say, well, that's what you get for allowing abortion and gay rights in the United States. I couldn't believe that didn't put them straight out of business. Um, but that was the first response to the Christian right, and I don't think it should be forgotten. As if to emulate that, uh, in the same week, people like Howard Zinn and um, Norman Finkelstein and Noam Chomsky and many other people who actually really do think no better were saying roughly the same sort of thing. And Michael Moore, people like that, Oliver Stone. I mean, I, I've debated almost all of these people now, not Chomsky, not in person, only in email. Um, saying, well, yes, it's because of our, our, our imperial uh, conquests and so forth. Um, as if bin Ladenism was some kind of liberation theology. It's it's just piffle, all this. I'm not having anything to do with that. Did you lose friends after 9-11? Um, yes, I guess I must have done. No, well, to the extent that one lost them, I'm not sure that they were friends, if you see what I mean. But there were people who um, wrote and said un unkind things about your humble servant, and that sort of thing, and, which seemed to suggest they wouldn't want to see me again if, if they meant what they'd said. Well, in that case, fine. What, do you have a relationship anymore with S Sidney Blumenthal at all? No, no, that's not somehow possible. Why not? Well, we had a very different opinion of what his president, Mr. Clinton, was up to, both as a politician and as um, a man, especially a man in relation to certain females who I thought were telling the truth and who... Sydney thought were not, and Sydney, who who had has many many talents, um, seemed to me to have been hired by the president to prostitute those talents, to to essentially to defame and discredit those women, and I I just found it too repulsive to put up with any more, and I took it to the length, which a lot of people thought was too too much, of 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 testifying 
contradicting Sidney directly when he said that the White House had not tried to smear Monica Lewinsky as a stalker. stalker. Yeah, I knew, to th I knew absolutely for sure at first hand that that wasn't true, that they had tried to smear her as a stalker. I, just, I think now no one denies it, but uh, because of the circumstances of the impeachment trial where I said I would have called to testify to that, it meant that Sidney and I had something of a, of a breach. How did that incident change your life or your relationships in Washington? Um, well, I th in two ways. One, I think that even if one what is or can be argued to be uh, in the right or trying to tell the truth, uh, or, or indeed telling it, there's the, a lot of people I can quite see will often think, well, someone is still acting in some ways as an informer. That's, not, that's the unpleasant insinuation. Uh, and on the left, this is very, very strong. Uh, tradition. Um, it's sort of almost like a law of a murder. You know, anyone who testifies to a hearing is sort of like a fink, as a rat, as a stool pigeon. That, that's culture. Um, so I got a lot of sidelong looks about that. And of course, there were many, many people who thought and still think that it was nothing to do with the performance of the president's responsibilities or with his performance as a politician that he had this squalid side to him, and, and always had had. Um, but that's a different disagreement. Next call for Christopher Hitchens on In Depth, Rio Vista, California. Hi, Mr. Hitchens. That's a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Uh, I think you're a person of rare uh, honor and integrity in the intellectual community, and as a religious person myself, I feel like your work... Uh, helps me to uh, hold myself to a higher standard. Um, and I wondered if well, you're familiar with the work of uh, Joseph Campbell and uh, Ken Wilber, whose views, I think, basically say that the problem with religion is the mythic level of religion, which you so effectively criticize. And Campbell uses uh, James Joyce, who I notice is one of your uh, favorite writers to uh, bolster that opinion. So I wondered if you could comment about that, and thank you very much for your well, work. Well, first, thank you for being so generous, and second, I you catch me really forced to admit that I'm I'm very underread on on Joseph Campbell, and it's an, it's an omission I I have thought of more than once of um, of repairing. I know that he was something of a supporter of. Um, the psychological views of uh, Carl Gustav Jung, of which I'm slightly suspicious, I must say. But I, I know also that he's, he's written what seems quite provocative and interesting stuff about the role of myth and legend in informing religious orthodoxy. And uh, I owe it to myself probably to be better informed the next time I get asked about this. Next call, Sarasota, Florida. Yes, can you all hear me? I'm calling on a... We're going to move on to Twin Falls, Idaho. Idaho, yes. you're on the air. Yes, yes. We're openers, Mr. Hitchens. It's a great pleasure to speak to you, sir. Thank you. I am um, I'm hoping that I could at least have an intelligent question for you. Uh, just from my own opinion, from what I am seeing of you, uh, it sounds like you are somewhat of a dichotomy, and that it makes me... Uh, that's not bad, of course, but it, it does make you very complicated. I am wondering... Uh, what relation or where do you put um, um, the Mr. William F. Buckley and his uh, intellectual approach and his ideology? Well, that, yes. Um, Mr. Buckley was incredibly good to me when he was running Firing Line, his, his flagship TV show. Um, it would have me on quite often, and I remember thinking with Firing Line, unlike a lot of debate, shows on TV, if you left that studio thinking, damn, I wish I'd made that point or made that point that way, it was your fault. You'd had every chance to do it. No one was trying to hurry you up or shut you down or, or cut you off. Um, it, was, it was very impressive, and I, I'm grateful to him for that style, and indeed the, the, the style in which, for the most part, he ran um, National Review, but you know, I can't conceal the fact that, I mean, especially on his editorship, the National Review was the, was the world view of the Catholic right wing, I mean, not excluding you know, General Franco and, and Joseph McCarthy, and um, I couldn't be further away from any interpretation of that kind. Quite, I actually, I don't much go for spy throw. 
novels either, but one or two of his Blackford Oaks uh, books amused me too. Sorry, just wanted to add that. Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, yes, Mr. Hitchens, I'd like to ask you uh, what you think of, uh, well, in this country, I guess, in particular, but you're experienced all throughout the world in uh, religious fundamentalism, fanaticism, or whatever, but uh, what do you think is the level of hypocrisy between uh, those who espouse religion and uh, fundamentalism or whatever, and what you think they really do believe as such and uh, feel it within their yes. spirit? And I just wondered if you could comment on that in this country and, and, you know, perhaps throughout the world even. Yes, there's a very interesting question, and uh, one has to ask it all the time, and it's been lent some point recently by the revelation of Mother, Mother Teresa's loss of, of um, it may not be correct to say exactly total loss of faith, but great loss of conviction of certainty in, in her faith. Um, with someone like, say, um, Billy Graham, I think one can see all the symptoms of a, of a self-conscious fraud. I mean, someone who doesn't believe any of this at all, but is a, fair, a reasonably good businessman. I have a reason for thinking that, apart from the, the terrible appearance that he gives in public, the, I mean, this, the appallingly phony appearance, I mean to say, there was a, there was a, a Canadian Billy Graham, a contemporary of his, um, who north of the border was that, that crusade embodied, called uh, James Templeton, who wrote a memoir uh, about the point where he himself realized that what he was talking was complete nonsense, and, and no sensible person could believe it. And he went to Billy Graham and said, well, look, here's what's happened to me. Can, can you really go on saying this stuff? And Graham basically says, it's too late to stop now. And lots of people expect it of me, and you know, we're in business. And um, that's what I think is the case with a surprisingly large amount of it. But I'm not, um, I don't want to sound vulgar about it. I mean, I, I know a lot of people to whom religion means everything or, or a very great deal, and who, who don't try to profit from it and has, don't stand to uh, profit from it either. So I, I don't reduce the, everything to, to a racket, but I think that racketeering is and always has been an important part of religion. Some religions simply are rackets. Scientology, for example, or Mormonism. It's, no, it's nothing more than the, the record of a, con, of a successful con job. But the spiritual life um, can't be entirely reduced to that. And here's the problem. You, in, when you ask, do people really believe that? There can't be an answer to it because they, they don't know any more than you do whether there was a virgin birth or a resurrection. If they say, I believe it, they're still, they, they're still believing in something that they have to know very probably didn't take place. So what are they asking us to believe? They're asking us to believe their propensity to faith, in other words, to take something on faith without argument or evidence. Well, if somebody wants me to believe that of them, that they will do that, then I will. But I feel that they're arguing against themselves and probably doing themselves an injustice. You think Billy Graham's an evil man? Yes, disgustingly evil man. I'll tell you again why I say that, I mean, uh, choosing one out of a, a number of possible uh, answers. I think that uh, anti-Jewish prejudice is an unfailing sign of a sick and disordered person. It's a, it's, there are some kinds of prejudice. For example, I don't terrifically like people from Yorkshire, as it happens. I don't know why, but I don't. But I, I don't think that convicts me of anything really insanitary. I, I probably would be a better person if I liked more people from Yorkshire. Anti-Semitism isn't like that. It's a, it's a, it's a horrible... Uh, conspiratorial, pseudo-intellectual, mean-spirited, eventually lethal uh, piece of bigotry. You read the stuff that uh, Graham's been found saying to Richard Nixon on tape. You can get it from the Nixon Library now on the Jewish question. Once you've got over the revelation, which wasn't much of a revelation to me, of, of what a squalid little bigot President Nixon was, I, I guess I knew that, you find that he's outmatched by the way that Billy Graham talks. Well, it doesn't mind. He, he does that in private and uh, harbors that stuff in private, and then goes out and, uh, and uh, rakes in the cash for preaching brotherhood and compassion. It's enough to make you sick. Who's an American president that you? And there's also there's no president, who, however uh, deserving of condemnation, who can't get Billy Graham to come to his side at just the point he should, he's about ready. To, or should be about ready to be, be either impeached or to be, make, make some kind of public apology or change of policy. No, this sort of valet, this religious valet is always at their hand. 
saying, no, no, I can make this look good for you. I can, I can, I can be your religious PR man. Power worshipper. Cronyism. Bigotry. It's a very unattractive combination. And then going around spouting lies to young people. For a living. Lying to the young for a living. What a horrible career. I, I, I gather it's soon to be over. I certainly hope so. Uh, who's an American president you admire? Um, well, how, can I start from the beginning? I mean, sure. yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't choose Mr. Jefferson as my subject. I was asked if I would do him. But he's, he's clearly, in many ways, the most admirable because he's the most various. I mean, he, he could have been a great, he could be a great lawyer. He could have been a great architect. He could have been a great paleontologist. He could have been um, a great author um, um, in innumerable ways. He had a man of really extraordinary talent. The only thing he was bad at was his actual job, which was farming. But then the tobacco and slave economy sort of deserved to fail, I guess. Um, and of course, his role in deepening and prolonging the institution of slavery is the, is the great outstanding black mark against him. But He's the most uh, most extraordinary of the presidents, I believe. And certainly of the founding ones. Uh, Mr. Lincoln's the most probably absorbing one to study psychologically. Um, of the most of the more recent ones, I think uh, the man who used to live in my building, um, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. I see there's a new biography of him by Michael Corder to be coming out soon. I'm, I'm definitely going to see it because I have a feeling that he hasn't had justice quite done to him yet. Next call for Christopher Hitchens, Portland, Oregon. Yes, sir, I've enjoyed listening to you uh, speak. I'd like to know of the politicians on the scene now, who would you vote for for president in the coming election? No, I have no plans to vote for any of them. Are you going to vote? Probably not. Really? Look, well, I have a column, you know, and I have uh, people have me on TV and I go on the radio all the time. I can tell people my opinions. Um, I don't feel I, I have no means of expressing my preferences or my views, but I, there's no individual who could do that for me who might hand my franchise and say, okay, I'd like you to represent me. No, not a, none of this crowd anyway. But you're a citizen now. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's a waste, isn't it? It's a, it's a shame because I live in Washington, D.C. where the vote is meaningless for the, for the we're disenfranchised for Congress. Still have to pay taxes with disenfranchised. And, um, and I don't have a party affiliation and there's no politician I like. But I will, I will, of course, in the end vote for whoever takes the toughest line on Iraq. What about as a symbol of democracy? Well, I'm not, the funny thing is, you see, it's not yet clear to me who that will be, or even if there will be one. It's quite possible that there won't be a candidate who represents my views on Iraq. What about as a symbol of democracy, though? Isn't that important to vote? Um, no. I know, I know what you mean. I know that people say... Think of all the struggles and sacrifices that it took. Will these include my right to abstain? Kerry, North Carolina, you're on with Christopher Hitchens. Yes, Christopher, thank you for uh, your work and your appearance. Uh, I contend that the press in the USA is a quasi-governmental agency because of their constitutional protection, but they're unaccountable as the other three branches are. I think this is a serious um, laps and causes a lot of damage. I think we need to reform somehow and make the press accountable. What are your opinions? Don't have, I, sometimes, you know, I can't think of anything to say. Hardest thing to admit if you're someone like me, and especially if you're on the air, say that nothing occurs to me. Joan Judge. Better, better that than blather, then, don't you think? Joan Judge, Hudson, Massachusetts. I once heard you call Colin Powell the world's most overrated human being. <laughs> Would you comment on his role in perpetuating the Wilson Plain debacle? What do you think motivated him to let the country, uh, to let the country, not to mention the individuals involved, suffer through this ordeal? It's true. What I said about Colin Powell was that having more or less been elected as the most overrated man in the United States, he was going for the gold to be the most overrated man in the world. I don't understand it at all. It's all reputation as far as I can see. But basically done by kissing up and kissing down, and never better illustrated in this case than by his willingness to support the president when he thought things were going that way in Iraq, and then to subtly undermine him with a campaign of, of leaks and disinformation when things were getting sticky in Iraq. And the lady questioner is absolutely right. It is a scandal that 
um, Mr. Powell's best friend and a colleague and protege, Mr. Armitage, always knew that he was the man who'd given Ms. Plame's identity to uh, Robert Novak. Um, I'd just watched many of his colleagues be put through a hideous legal mill when a word from him could stop the whole thing. A gigantic waste of government time, colossal waste of resources, a uh, huge acreage of, of tedium and misinformation in the in the press, which thought it had a story when it didn't, um, and quite an unforgivable performance by the State Department and really everyone in it, and, and the fish rotting right from the head in this case. Trent Whitney, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You have at times defined yourself as a Trotskyite, but I've never heard you speak to what that political philosophy means. Well. Um, you should say Trotskyist, by the way. It's a point of etiquette. I mean, it's, it's too complicated to explain. He does. I didn't. Oh, okay. But he does. He got it right. Well, this goes back to something that seems rather arcane now, but was very vivid at one point, which was the split in the socialist movement between the uh, supporters of Joseph Stalin and the, the supporters of what was known in, in Russia as the left opposition, whose leader was Leon Trotsky one of the original Bolshevik revolutionaries and the founder of the Red Army, who, after being expelled from the Soviet Union in 1927, tried to set up an international revolutionary organization to oppose Joseph Stalin and his policies and also to warn against the rise of Hitler. Uh, Trotsky's best writing, if you ever want to look any of this up, <coughs> is, is his writing warning, warning the German workers what would happen if Hitler came to power, and, and everyone else in the world too. By far the most prescient, more so than anything even that Churchill ever wrote. And it ended with um, Trotsky being assassinated on Stalin's orders in Mexico in 1940. In the meanwhile, he, Trotsky was, uh, was involved with the sort of world of literary modernism. He, with Andre Breton, helped write a revolutionary manifesto about the arts. He was quite closely associated with the group around Partisan Review in New York, of the New York intellectuals so called um, Dwight MacDonald. Um, being one, um, Max Schachmann, um, trying to think of some others, Clement Greenberg. Um, George Orwell considered himself to be, in a small way, a sympathizer with, with Trotsky. C.L.R. James, Victor Serge. So the, the word represents a sort of allegiance to a now buried and lost tradition of independent Marxist revolutionary thought and action, identified with a rather charismatic and rather, um, well, uh, flawed heroic figure. Sorry if that's, if that answer sounds cryptic, um, I could just suggest that you had a look at the Isaac Deutsch's three volume biography of Trotsky. It's called um, The Prophet. Very beautifully written account of his life and opinions. San Diego, you're on the air with Christopher Hitchens. Ah, fun to talk with you. Would you comment on our American hubris in willingness to accept our loss of industrial economic competitiveness with more actively government-involved economies such as Japan and China? Also, about, tell about your writings for free inquiry. And have you read much of Isaac Asimov's non-fiction science, uh, non science writings? <coughs> um, in reverse order, I once went to hear Isaac Asimov gave a lunchtime talk at Columbia University in New York was, um, in the early 1980s. It was an attack on the revival of the creationist movement. Um, a very brilliant and witty talk. I'm not a science fiction reader myself. I, I, I don't even like the, the masters like Philip K. Dick and others. I find them very hard to read. I've never, never had much, taken much stock in science fiction, but I've, I've read some other polemics as, by Asimov as well as seeing him give that very spirited address and well my work for free inquiry which is a wonderful magazine of humanist and atheist and agnostic writing um, which everyone ought to subscribe to um, is to, to contribute a column uh, every other month or so pointing out the wickedness of religion or, or, or advocating for reason in some other way um, and it's very nice of you to notice it um, well there must be a reason to, to your third point why no one ever asks me what our policy of industrial relations with um, China and Japan ought to be. And maybe it's because I don't get asked that the economy is in such bad shape, but I doubt it. Another email, Mark Geigal uh, from Beckley, West Virginia. 
Thank you for your commentaries in The Atlantic. Thank you for protecting Salman Rushdie. Congratulations on being an American citizen. That all said, while Brits are generally welcomed as well-educated, insightful, and smart in America, why do Brits at home often favor the depiction of Americans as little more than dumb, violent, and fat? Is it just in the British nature to be cynical and snarky about everybody? Um, there certainly is an element of that in the British character, yes. But uh, and there is another thing, which is that um, the United States overhauled and outstripped um, the United Kingdom as a world and power and cultural and economic center um, to what seems to most people quite a long time ago, but is in the British mind very, very fresh and um, among many, many people not forgiven. So there's the, what the, the British compensation for this loss of power um, is to uh, regard, rather as the Greeks uh, reacted to being overhauled and overtaken and eventually dominated by the Roman Empire, uh, to take the revenge of thinking of their superiors as culturally inferior. That's, um, that's why um, the great po Polish poet uh, Milos once referred to irony as the glory of slaves. Um, that kind of sarcasm or bitterness uh, is, is the, the revenge of those who've been, um, uh, could come off second. Badkaw, Arkansas. Uh, thank you. It's uh, so nice to have an opportunity to ask Mr. Uh, Hitchens a question. Sir, as a parent, a uh, lifelong atheist and a rather successful one, what kind of advice could you give a fellow atheist living in the Bible Belt of the United States on how to survive, how to be successful with the subtle bigotries and discrimination that uh, the religious uh, people have toward um, um, uh, us atheists? Thank you. Well, um, just don't let them push you around. This is America. And also, I would suggest um, maybe contact, uh, find a way of contacting the very large number of other people there are in Arkansas who think the same way as you do. The, the beginning of wisdom in this is to realize that uh, it's happened to me a lot of times on my book tour. In, in Arkansas, in fact, in one, one case at the book festival there, um, people come in their hundreds to hear an atheist speaker, and they're many, almost all of them have come because they're afraid that if they don't, I'll be the only one there. Uh, they, they just feel they had to sort of show sympathy. They're amazed to find how many other people want to do the same thing. Try that. That'll be interesting. And it'll also uh, put a crease of alarm in the pinched and scrawny faces of the pious. David Seedman, West Hollywood, California. As an immigrant to the U.S., what do you think about the controversy over immigration to the U.S., the current immigration debate? Well, um, not to be too uh, sententious about it, but I did go through a long, quite long, actually often quite boring and arduous process of doing it legally. And um, I think I'm probably not the only legal immigrant who doesn't want to see people skip that. Um, so the, there is that. Um, well, to, it, it, using, making, in a sense, the same point in a different way, no one who has been an immigrant, and after all, it wasn't that, wasn't that difficult for me. To it um, likes looking down on other people who want to be immigrants too. The real question is, what are we talking? Are we talking about should, should there be any more immigration? Which some people some people think there should, some should. Or should there be any more illegal immigration? Those are two very radically different questions. Palm Desert, California. You're on in depth with Christopher Hitchens. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that uh, we were made by a God seems to me harmless enough in and of itself. The problem I see is with all the baggage uh, that it, uh, commonly rides on the back of that belief. Uh, that is, uh, adherence to a rigid body of doctrine or dogma and uh, obedience to an authority that claims God as its provenance. All through history, we've seen how that baggage has been abused in every faith that claims to be the true one. Uh, but uh, I wonder if you wouldn't think that uh, it might be possible to believe in a god and not be led by the nose, and, and isn't that the argument we ought to be having? Well, yes, and we touched on it a, a little earlier um, in the distinction I made 
when talking of Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine, between deism and theism. There are those who say, well, look at the natural world, the, the order of the universe, etc. Et you, you can't picture it without having some originating creator. But if, suppose you granted that deistic assumption, your work as a theist would be all still to come. You, you still have to prove this, this God knows you're here, or cares that you are, or is going to intervene in your life, or would answer your prayers, or even listen to them. That, that's, that still hasn't even been properly suggested, let alone proved. So that, that might help to illuminate the distinction. However, if people say that we are, we are literally made, in other words, with a purpose, fashioned by God, I think they commit two errors right away which I'm sorry I think do lead to all the, the garbage and baggage that you identify, and to some worse stuff too. Here's why. It, it's, it's at once, it's too masochistic and it's too solipsistic. In other words, it makes you, as the Quran says, fashioned from a clot of blood or the Bible says from dust. That's what you are, and, but incidentally, um, with original sin stirred in. So there you are, effectively a worm, um, the prisoner of, a, of an omnipotent uh, dictator. But um, so, uh, as if to compensate for that sort of abject, groveling uh, analysis of your condition, you're, you're told that the whole universe is all about you, and that the, the God has a plan with you in mind, and that you are, in some sense, the center of things as well. Now, both of these things are extraordinarily unwholesome for the human personality, and they also are remarkably out of conformity with anything we can recognize as cosmic or global reality. Okay. That's why the religion really began to decline when it was revealed that um, the sun does not go around the earth and by analogy and in general that we are not the center or the object of things. The Big Bang did not occur so we could be here. The process of evolution did not occur so I could be sitting here now. We get over that idea, these, these uh, crazy self-centered ideas masquerading as, as humility and modesty, we'd be intellectually and morally much better off right away. The word, uh, the concept of solipsism comes up a lot in your writing. What does it mean and why do you use it? It means, it means the, the belief that no one is important except you. So I have to use it a lot because it's a very <laughs> commonly encountered belief. And very often, of course, the people who have it don't realize they've got it. So it's your agreeable job to point it out to them. That's what they're suffering from. Next call for Christopher Hitchens, who was born in Portsmouth, England in 1949, Buffalo, New York. Yes, I have two statements, and I think the reason you have trouble with your belief system, Christopher, is because you didn't get a chance to form one when you were young. You got sent to a boarding school, apparently, and so you didn't really have a belief system. I remember being eight, and I wondered why a lady, how a lady could have a baby. It was a movie, and without a doctor, and I thought the people in the movie were lying to me because it couldn't happen. There was no doctor there. I had no understanding of it, so therefore it seemed a lie. But I tell you, faith comes from experience. The people are not reading things and believing it. It comes from experience. If you, I, I saw my mother pray, so that's why I learned it from. I saw her pray every night, kneeling, until she got too old to get up. Then she would kneel in bed. Then I had to try it for myself because I got so sick and I couldn't get well. And I finally did get well. It was a mental thing, and I finally recovered. And it took some months to do it, or a lot of long weeks, but I just woke up one day and I was well. But my real shown-up belief in God came when I had an instantaneous healing. I was at home alone, sick again, and I just prayed and asked God to come sit beside me and help me, and it was to Jesus. And I felt the heat like they always explain it was come over me. And I mean, it was momentarily. I was sick one minute and well the next, and I just got up and went to sleep, and the next day I went to work. I was totally instantaneously healed. Black people have to believe in God, or else we'd still be in slavery. There is a God. You just don't know. And if you want to know if it's true, put it to the test. Try it. Pray some time and see if anything happens. It's happened enough for me that I can't have a doubt. And the same is with psychic phenomena. If something has happened to you, a thing happens, and then it comes to pass. You dream a thing, and it comes to pass more than once. It has to be a fact. It can't be a lie. Thank, Thank you, you, caller. No response? No, I take it as a comment. Have you ever prayed? 
Uh, what do you say to no, that? Well, no, that's I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. I mean, one was forced to pray um, several times a day. With some of the things you had to say aloud, um, the Nicene Creed, for example, or sometimes um, the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer, and so forth. So yeah, I've in, I've intoned that. Yes, and then then I discovered that um, they can make you come to church, they, but they can't actually make you pray. You don't have to do that. And I stopped. Uh, I stopped singing the hymns, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't kneel or bend forward when it was prayer time. They, and there was nothing they could do about that, because the law only says you have to go; it doesn't say you've got to leave. Um, in the New Yorker profile, but I would feel ashamed of myself if I did pray, because that is uh, what solipsism. I'm afraid that's what the lady was suffering from there too, for all her obvious sweet and genuine character. She thinks the world is all about her, and that Jesus is listening in case she has anything to say. It's all, it sounds so modest, doesn't it? So humble. It's an incredibly arrogant claim, as well as an absolutely ludicrous one. If people got well by praying, ma'am, I suppose I have to say this to you, we wouldn't be in the case that we are, with so many people desperately sick. Why do you think... Beyond the reach even of the skilled medicine, which is the only hope of a, of a cure. It is, it is not that. That is not how people get better. It's... Um, why do you think then that over a billion people on this earth think there's some kind of a higher power? I don't know that they do, but I think that the reason would be let's let's grant that that, that they really do believe this and uh, give them credit for for sincerity in the belief. My analysis in my book is this: we we are pattern seeking animals. It's a good thing about us that we we look for patterns, we look for um, recurrences and consistencies and so forth. And it's a, it's a weakness as well as a strength because we, for example, we prefer a conspiracy theory to no theory at all. But we do look for patterns, and it's quite difficult for us to imagine that we don't know the cause of things or the first cause. We, we like to think we could find that out. Um, and we also have, we've, it's very easy to persuade us that things are all about us and that we're the object of all this. So if people say, well, um, Look, you know, these the stars move in a predictable way. Um, the seasons move in a predictable way. There must be some system here. It must it must mean something? Um, it must have been started by someone. Now, as you know, all of these are completely unwarrantable assumptions. But they, the counter 